um, a mom of two, very proudly. Um, and I sit on the Milton Keynes Community Foundation Board as well, as well as uh, the Work Youth Board. Um, so we'll get to know a little bit more about you. Right. I think that gives us sort of a flavour. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patricia. That's lovely. And um, Ganesh, I think he was hoping to be here this morning, but he probably hasn't been because it was um, obviously they've just appointed before Christmas, so we haven't had commitments in January, but uh, we will catch up with him soon. And also, I just want to acknowledge that Deb is now a substantive non executive director. So, congratulations and welcome as a substantive member. Um, I don't think there's anything now. We've got some apologies just from Heidi, who's um, on jury service. And Gary is joining us um, online because he's abroad at the moment and Bev um, is under the weather. So very kindly is keeping her germs to herself and um, dialing in from home. So welcome to you both as well. Um, are there any declarations of interest? Great, thank you very much. Um, so that really just leads us on to the patient story. And to you both this morning. Before I everyone is welcome, thank you for welcoming us to your meeting this morning. Pleased to be here and share our story with you. So my name is Julie Goodman. I'm Can you speak up a little bit? Otherwise, people. All right. You. Sorry. I've got a bit of a... <laughs> sorry. I was saying thank you very much for welcoming us this morning to your meeting, to your board meeting. Um, and we're very pleased to be here to share a patient story with you. I'm here to support Connie. who will be taking most of the story and our group. Um, in, so to speak. Um, and as I say, my name is Judy Goodman. I'm the Head of Patient and Family Experience. Hello, good morning. Um, and again, I echo thank you for having us here today. Um, my name is Connie Wake, and I am the Quality Improvement Lead. Um, recently joined post in uh, about three months ago. So this is all new and exciting for me. Um, we are hoping to share with you today what AI life stories uh, lean to staff that have experienced them and um, how we can perhaps take that forward um, in a bigger way across the trust. So um, we'll go through a bit of the story and what happens afterwards and, and we'll work on what we can um, so what is appreciative inquiry? So some of you may remember when the We Culture team came in a couple of years back um, and they took us through various techniques and tools and principles um, and it encompassed caring conversations um, and ways of collaborating and talking to one another and talking in an open and honest way um, with feeling. So it got down and delved into <coughs> the matters to start what our values are, what matters to patients, um, and it opened up a lot of conversations that took us through perhaps how we could develop ourselves, perhaps how we could develop services, um, just small ways, but some of those small ways can really lead to good, imp sorry, good improvements, good practices, um, and enhanced safety um, and clinical effectiveness. So, it matters in all those areas where it needs to matter in a hospital. And um, so this, as I said, there's a set of four principles. Some of those were uh, words, words create worlds, uh, working with people, not on people, which is something that they really sort of focused on. And um, being the expert of your own experience and, and opening up curiosities, opening up questions. Um, so since the uh, We Culture team left us in October, we've been trying to continue that journey and, and making sure that these stories still stay alive with us and still continue. Um, some areas in the hospital have been continuing and been doing it really, really well. And staff are, are really engaging when I've seen these happen. And they really want to be part of it and they really want to offer their thoughts as well after a story. So life stories, it's the life stands for learning and innovating from everyday experience. So the stories are often <laughs> with an organisation um, and it's what we care about, what matters, what our values are. Uh, this is the appreciative action re um, it's the research cycle. Um, pretty similar to what we see with the PDSA really. Um, but just with more values, more thoughts, 
um, and more curiosity, just a different way of approaching it. So you've got your discovery um, and then that's like the curiosity, the asking the questions. You've got your envision, envision that could be what do you dream it could be like. Um, you co-create, this is like a playful area. Could, could we try this? Perhaps we could try this in a different way. How are we doing this? Could we do it better? Um, and then we've got the embedding. So making sure it's sustainable, your little changes. How can we share that? How can we make sure that we continue that good work? With capturing story, um, there's various tools that the Weed Culture team um, left us with, which is great, and they're available on the internet. Um, a lot of them were done using images um, and emotion words. Uh, these just helped to capture the story in a more significant way um, and opening up the, the patients or the staff and the relatives thoughts about what the experience was and just helping structure that story so that it gives it more depth, more meaning. Okay, so the first story, uh, one of the stories we used to take forward one of the live sessions was that we spoke to a patient in a surgical ward. Um, and it's, as you'll see up there, there's some words that have actually been um, put in bold. So these are the words directly from, from the person's mouth and um, her feelings at the time. Um, we have obviously summarised it, but I just want to emphasise that the words in bold are the words that, that this patient used. So the story for this was that the patient was in, she was expecting to go to surgery that night. The nurses came around and said, did she want something to eat and drink? And she said, no, thank you. I'm expected to have surgery tonight. Um, she later then was informed that the surgery wasn't actually going ahead. Um, but by then she'd already drank some coffee. Um, and then she drank some coffee, sorry, thank you, pardon. Um, so she drank some coffee, relaxed and thought, right, OK, it's not going ahead. Shortly after the coffee, the surgeon actually turned up on the ward and actually um, said, believed that surgery was going ahead. So he, he thought she was going to be ready for surgery. And obviously as a result of the coffee, he couldn't go ahead. So um, she did eventually get, she did get her surgery and that, that was good. But both the patient and the, and the surgeon were extremely frustrated over what had occurred, which was seemingly through communication errors. So post-surgery, she was on the ward and she then talked about her experience. She talked about the call bell not always being answered in a timely way. Um, she was using, the nurses were, were um, asking her to use a bedpan. She found this quite embarrassing and, and quite difficult to use. And it, this then caused extra work for the staff, which she was very conscious of because often the bed would become wet or she actually got to, to the stage where the nurses were really busy and she didn't like to, to bother them because she felt they were so busy and she actually soiled the bed. And again, that caused the extra work for the nurses. So the patient used some really quite um, powerful words in describing how she felt. And she said she felt powerless. She couldn't do anything for herself. Um, and she was really reliant on nurses. Um, and, and I think just thinking about that as a patient, how you would feel in a bed and that feeling of powerlessness must be awful. Um, she observed the staff around her, particular staff were wonderful, not all of them, but um, certain staff were wonderful, which is again another lovely descriptive word, word for our staff. They clearly enjoyed their job and, and they were calm and concerned and always introduced themselves to her. She knew exactly who they were and what they were going to do. And generally the, the ward was a nice atmosphere, which is really lovely feedback. And the nurses um, made her feel important and they remembered what her specific needs were, which made her feel better. And she, it, the end result was that her, if you like, her summary of the, her stay was that she felt supportive and cared for as an individual and felt like me. So I think what we're, what we're demonstrating, what Connie will go on to talk about when we, when we go into the story and really delve into the story, is that this didn't start off very well. But the nurses involved in her care brought this experience background and she went out of that ward at home feeling that she'd been very well cared for and, and most importantly cared for as an individual. 
So I'll leave Camille to what happened next. Thank you. It's a lovely summary. Thanks, Julie. <coughs> so, um, so if stories have legs, what we then do is after we've explored the story with a group is we go through a series of questions and that just opens up um, everyone in the room to share what they value from the story, what they've got to celebrate, um, what their curiosity, curiosities are about why things didn't go as they planned to go um, and, and what can be done to take, what can be taken away from that, what can we go away and do today? That could be something small, it could be something big. Um, so, and often I've seen in these um, sessions that people are really willing to engage with this. Um, there's some great feedback that they give. Uh, so these are just some of the examples from that story when we've told that story to groups, what they said. Um, so as you can see, there's some really good examples of, of how they felt about the story and, and what they picked out from it. Um, so just highlighted there was what I thought were, were great comments about the patient being valued at the end of the stay and felt like me. So that was really important for someone to stay. Um, and where support was offered, they noticed that the patient did get support at certain times. There's this just a little curious owl opening, which I quite liked, and um, so fit the theme. So when asking what are you one, what are you wondering about the story, what are you curious about? Um, they were wondering where the communication breakdown was. So is that something we could go back and we could just explore that a little bit more for this patient? And so it doesn't happen again. Um, were these problems escalated at the time? Um, and was there an apology offered? So based on the discussions, what do you hope for going forwards? Um, and people were offered up to, that they would speak to patients about their expectations because everybody's different. We don't offer the same as all. Uh, to be treated like I want to be treated, not how you want to be treated. So um, everybody's expectations might be different. Um, taking back discussions within their own teams um, and capturing what's important in their areas. Um, steps to prevent the same thing happening again. Empowering patients to input into their own care. So talking to that patient, okay, you know, what is it? What support do you need? And um, what can we offer? And then the final question is, so this is really them taking forward their own actions, um, and which is all to do with improvement. So easing patients' anxiety, it might seem a, a small thing, it might seem something that should happen all the time. But when you hear stories like this, you think actually, that's not an everyday perhaps occurrence as it should be. So it's just bringing that back into your conscious working daily life um, and showing empathy and respect and support, all good morals, all good values, but just as a, a reminder to oneself sometimes that we need to do these things a little bit more. Um, and it might be more important for some patients than others or relatives or other staff even. Um, and then there's other, thing, other things I've highlighted on there, exploring how to do things differently was a, a good one as well. How can, how can we make an improvement on this? Um, and supporting colleagues, which was very important because, as you said, in the story, some staff seemed absolutely happy in their work and, and, will, and <coughs> caring and all of the things that you would hope to see all the time displayed. And, and some not so. So, you know, what? let's have a look at that. Why isn't that happening all the time? <clears throat> so another example of catching quick stories, um, because we all like to do things a little bit quicker if we can, is having these pos positive practice posters. Now, they should be up everywhere. Um, and if there's anywhere that's not, please let us know. Um, and what they're for is just to put on quick experiences from anyone, from another member of staff offering you a cup of tea at a hard time. And this can be sort of something big that's happened, something small that's happened, but something that you can gather a few people around, have a little 
chat with some of the questions at the bottom, what you liked about that practice, what, how could we do something a bit similar, how can we continue that, and they can be just used at huddles, and so just a quick message up there, um, and using that positivity and spreading that positivity, and that's what these are for. Some places are using them quite well, I've seen, and some are not so, but... So what we hope for going forward with, that didn't quite come out as I planned. I don't know what's going on about now. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so I thought capturing more stories like this, um, I think they're really useful to help um, develop and build systems with. Involving patients, obviously, in their care and, and in these stories, I think is vital because it brings that that depth and, and what the patient experience is um, really matters to us as, a, as an organisation. And empowering staff to make those improvements. So things that they've suggested, things that we've talked about, can, how can you go back and do that? What is going to enable you to do that? Um, Presenting these stories on a regular basis is something that we want to continue in. Um, and then capturing that learning in, in a recorded way somehow, in a repository of stories that we have on the internet, and sharing that out, sharing those positive practices out for others to hopefully so take on for themselves. Wanted to say thank you very much for your time. Um, That's great. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions from colleagues? I think this is a really positive. I mean, it's a it's a great approach. I think to 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 learning, you know, and reinforcing learning from what's not gone so well, but recognising that an awful lot does go well. So I think that's it's a really good approach. And it's great to see it. Um, being used and, and hopefully we'll be building on it, which will be even better. Yes, uh, that yeah, hopefully. Hey. Uh, Connie, Julie, thank you. Yeah, just to echo uh, Alison's words. Always really, really great to hear you. So, so, <coughs> direct from you guys. Um, I was just wondering how pervasive is the use of AI within within the hospital? I, I, you know, I know that's quite a hard question to answer, but mm -hmm. how many kind of departments have you touched or, mm -hmm. you know, how? So I think at the beginning, there was quite a few, um, I think over 30 staff probably attended the AI training um, from various areas all across the trust. Um, and I think they were sort of in the leadership roles. Um, it's not 30 areas doing it. So I know that much. Um, I did try to run catch up with the people that I had attended the training to see where we were in the trust with what we were doing. Um, but I didn't get a very good attendance, unfortunately, it was just before Christmas. So we'll try again. Um, but there were, in certain areas, um, Termsey, for example, are doing, doing a lot with it um, and getting some really positive outcomes from it. Um, I believe there are, I think there are areas in surgery that have continued using um, stories from in their care to to focus on areas for improvement as well. And that's where it really comes into play is focusing on those areas mm -hmm. for improvement. So if you know you've got something that's not quite right or a complaint that's happened or something that you want to sort of open up a little bit more, um, then it's really, it's a really useful tool for doing that because it's, it works with the non-blame culture. It's just opening up those thoughts in a um, sort of non-biased way, really, and just making sure that you uh, included the patient in that as well, in that journey. Perhaps it's something we can, and certainly from the workforce committee, probably is a good area maybe to, to pick up and see how that's going as well, just to, to see how it develops, because it's really important, I think. Yeah, it'd be really good to get any sort of support behind it. Yeah, be great. Thank you. And um, Bev. You. Ben. Ben. Ben, we can't hear you on the phone. Oh, it's us. Oh, is it us? Oh, yeah, hang on, it's us. Is it us? Oh, no, we heard Gary earlier, didn't we? Yeah, she's not on mute. 
Why don't, uh, Gary, why don't you speak just to make sure it, it, we, <laughs> so we identify whether it's Bev or us. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, sorry. sorry. Sorry, Bev, it's it's you. <laughs> in the nicest like, possible way. Like <laughs> Might be worth dropping out and coming back in again. Perhaps can you save your question and we'll come with, maybe we can come back to the so can you Jimmy? Or post you your question in the chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Technology, yeah. of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That on the screen, I think. Sure. Yes, Ian. Uh, Hi, Julie. Thanks very much. So, so I'm a really passionate believer in the power of the patient narrative and also with confronting, I think that probably is the right word, sometimes start with that patient experience and the lived experience the patients had with us. It can be deeply uncomfortable as an experience, um, but it can be you know, really powerfully fulfilling once that discussion has happened. I guess for me, the, the challenge is really about how we engage thousands of members of staff in those conversations rather than four or five. Mm -hmm. And whilst you completely get the, the poster there, you, you demonstrated that, that Melinda from We Culture recommends is certainly one way to do it. Um, and you know, yes, a library or repository is also a good thing to have. For me, neither of those things quite you know, bring this to the masses. I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on that challenge. Just before I pause the question, it sort of goes back to, to Hayder's one of the things about AI, vision of inquiry, it's quite difficult to know where it's happening and how it's happening. The, the, you know, when it's really established, it's happening without people necessarily knowing or calling it AI. It's just a you know, different approach to conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. John, John Kate, come yeah, in first. Yeah, I'll show you my team out a little bit as well. Um, because we've got, um, so AI, obviously we had the we had the work with um, Belinda Dewar, who um, who helped us train staff, and we've now got a, a series of action learning sets. That I think we're going to take forward to keep that cohort of staff who were trained initially to remain expert um, and to continue to spread AI. Um, I think you know you're right. It's a big cultural change. It's our behaviours in action. Really, we talked about our behaviours, the behaviour framework last week about looking at, um, at you know about, about applying all the things that Connie and Jean talked about, um, reframing things as positive different way of learning, learning from the good, different ways of framing questions. It's, it's a very different framework um, and it will lead us nicely into um, patient safety and student response framework when we make those changes, piece then does that comes in as well. Um, so there's a lot, it's definitely, you know, work that's um, a work in progress, isn't it? It's, um, there's a lot to do. You're absolutely right, Ian, we need to immerse the organisation in it. Um, that will take us for years, you know, it, 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 to be able to do that, to get to a point where people are comfortably using it. Um, it also, you know, it means people working in a really different way and suspending, you know, cynicism and it's a really different way of working, isn't it, you know, and you have to be really open to that. So it takes a little while to move people into that space. I think once people start to use it, they recognise its apparent positivity that we've got. We're, we're, I think we're at the first, we're on the first kind of step of this journey, not near the end. Yeah, thanks. I think, can I just say on the back of the piece as well, I think it's about um, using it in, in different ways as well. So when we're talking about, we're just looking at the moment, the 15 steps program, whether we change that slightly, kids and I are in conversations. And so we would be going to the positive posters in the wards and talking with the ward about what was on their positive posters, what, was, what they had to celebrate. What, so it, it'll be about using it in, in the complaint as well. So very often now we'll get a, a complainant come in and then we'll talk to the ward. Um, about their experience, and, and as that Ian rightly said, it's so powerful because it hits your ear. If you hear it, if you read it, it impacts. But if you hear it, it definitely impacts. So it's about. So we use the AI techniques. There. We use the AI techniques to start preparing for a, what we call a local complaint resolution meeting. So they they have that caring conversation and so on framework to prepare themselves as well. So I think we can use it in other ways as well, and not just. In, in one way, and I think that's the way we get the spread of the staff because we're obviously we go out and we'll be going out on all the water areas as we, we introduce a 15 steps challenge concept. Really, there's huge potential, isn't there? Um, which is which is brilliant. Um, just to refer to Bev's um question, I mean, she said, um, great presentation and really interesting, and I think Bev. Actually, what you raised is around embedding and things. So it's very much, I think, what we've just been talking about. So hopefully that's that's answered your question. So yeah, I think the idea um, is that we, you know, we see what what we how we can develop this. Um, just one last comment, yeah. Alison. So thank you, ladies, for presenting. Um, 
the reason we cho we chose to pick this story in this particular format is because we want to expand this mm -hmm. and we want to expand it around these particular we want to get our clinical staff noticing and wondering with you know uh, the experience here that's been reflected is that that's an extraordinary experience for the individual patient and a common experience for us and it is hitting them between the eyes like what that feels like so what we'll be doing is and just like the latest have summarized is that this approach won't be used in one discrete avenue it'll be a broad range of them um, these stories weren't just sh uh, shared with the individual clinical team it was with at the band seven meetings so we'll be starting to structure our, our formal meetings with clinical staff around beginning and ending with one of these stories and asking them to think and reflect about what are you noticing and wondering about this patient's experience. So it means that the patient's experience isn't really isolated into an individual ward or their feedback. It gets that wider spread, but much like Kate and Julie and Connie have said, it's going to take us a bit of time to yeah. know that this is the beginning of that journey. Yeah. I think these things, it's developmental, isn't it? It's got to evolve, and um, there's some really, really positive things. So, thank you both very much again. Thank you. thank you for the time. Um, just before I move on to my report, uh, go on to the other bits, I should say. Again, yeah, welcome. Um, I did mention that you were one of our new uh, associate non executive directors. And it, can you just give us a little potted, because a lot of our colleagues are aware of um, you seeing it, and a little potted history would be great. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, slightly. I think I'm bent out the tower this morning. Yes. <laughs> uh, apologies, Beth. Yeah, so um, I'm Ganesh Bali. Uh, I, I currently work as a director of HPs in um, the Suffolk and North East Essex Integrated Care System. I live in Northamptonshire. Um, AHP, my background, and I'm very happy to join you on my, my particular interests are around the EDI. So, this particular methodology would be great to see how we can embed that with your EDI strategy, actually, in particular around continuity of care, for example, with maternity. So, yes, really, really happy to join you and, and look forward to working with you. Lovely. Um, obviously, we'll be arranging a few steps to, to meet and um, have a chat with colleagues um, as you get embedded. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, going back to the agenda then, minutes of the last meeting. Any um, comments or corrections needed, or is everybody happy? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, take them to um, red. Uh, matters arising. Um, <coughs> performance report um, number 12. Oh, that's very well, that's complete. First two completed. We'll have a at the end, Colin. Um, Going down to number 22, that's it for a verbal update. This is around the trend reporting. So perhaps if I um, start, uh, Emma, the, um, so we are recasting this report to make it more accessible. We have more um, recently obtained more access to comparative data. Um, <coughs> hopefully we should get the first version of this out for our next quarter. It'll go through an internal person, it'll go to our tech first. Yeah. Uh, but um, I'm hoping. Trust executive committee. Trust executive committee. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, 23 is completed, 24 the significant risk register. Um, so that is um, about when we agree our risk appetite statement. So, as Luke suggests, we perhaps do that, um, Chair, in the February seminar meeting. Brilliant. So, it will take a little bit of work. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything we might have missed on that arising? No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, going on then to my report, um, obviously the, you've got the written report there. Just a couple of things I needed to add. One is I should have mentioned the cattle service just before Christmas, which I attended, and actually it was lovely. It's the first one I managed to do. I didn't manage the, the one last year. And um, thanks to Sarah and Amanda and the team. It was a, a lovely sort of uh, hour or so. And it was interesting watching some of the patients looking out the windows and seeing staff pausing, coming by and, and listening. So it was it was a lovely event. We had the Inclusion Leadership Council meeting this week, and I hope Danielle will fill in anything I might forget to, to mention to the board. Um, just to note, we've had a review and a refocus of the group, and we've got a new agenda which we're going to run with, which has a few extra items on it not least getting formal feedback from um, the networks around the work that they're doing. And this will be coming to the board as well, just so that board members are aware of all the, I mean, there's some great work going on and we need to reflect that at the um, board level more, I guess it's certainly into our meetings in public as well. Um, and it's going to be a, a, a formal agenda item on the board. So we, we give it this slightly more formal feedback on that. 
but um, for this occasion, just uh, to, to pick up on a couple of points that we had um, at the meeting, uh, we had a discussion around um, CQC and what's required from them and, and how we um, obviously look at things in the organisation, but particularly around uh, members of staff being able to speak up on issues that um, would come under the CQC auspices. Um, and we want to encourage, obviously, and, and really uh, support staff using networks, freedom to speak up, anything like that, to raise it within the organisation. Obviously, anybody can raise matters with the, the Care Policy Commission, that they're perfectly entitled to do that. But we want to really develop that culture where people feel comfortable just raising it with, with colleagues or through, through other um, avenues. And um, the other thing was uh, for the networks themselves, some support and training on preparing business cases. We had a chat around um, uh, the funds that uh, networks now have that they, they use for themselves, but also other things that might come through from staff where they might like to uh, prepare a business case to, to um, present to the executive team and having support how to um, uh, prepare that thoroughly and uh, keep the right way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Unless anybody's got any questions on my report? No, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Joe. Okay, um, a few things. Obviously, uh, strikes and industrial action has been in the media uh, quite a lot recently. Uh, just to update you on a couple of things. One is South Central Ambulance Services that cover our patch. We have been um, relatively, <laughs> I use that term sort of advisedly, uh, relatively okay in relation to ambulance provision um, in, in Milton Keynes and the surrounds. And we've seen uh, uh, problems with non emergency patient transport, but we have not seen any significant issues in play through with emergency ambulances. Um, Likewise, we have not been affected at all by the nursing strike to date because there was less than a 50% rate cast required to go on strike. Um, we are just awaiting the outcome of the physiotherapy strike ballot. Daniel, if you're the latest on that. Yes, well, we know the physiotherapists here have did reach the 50% threshold and so have voted to strike. Um, and so the number of members we have here, though, is not, is not a uh, very large number compared to how many members they have other the trusts. Um, they've just announced yesterday, in fact, first tranche of trusts who will be um, experiencing strike at industrial action, um, I think at the end of January, and we're not on that list. Um, there's a further date planned for the 9th of February. We might be in that list, but I think they're doing it 30 trusts at a time, it seems. Um, and I know that our numbers here um, as I say, we're not as large in terms of membership as all the trusts, so I expect they will be going first with the trust of the larger membership. But obviously, that's just my my assumption from the from the list that you've seen. But uh, we'll watch to see what, if, when when and if we get added to the, the dates of strikes. And then the other group that we're awaiting the outcome of are the junior doctors, and, and they're currently um, about to, but we haven't had the outcome yet. So um, we will, of course, report <coughs> updates on that, and um, we will continue with the required contingent plan to keep services running here. Uh, in relation to operational pressures, and we'll come on to a bit later on. Uh, suffice to say that we continue. We have continued to break all known records of patients coming through to access urgent and emergency care. Um, and that has obviously put an increased stress onto the organisation over and above everything else that's going on. So um, it's absolutely worth the board noting that, and I'm sure you'll join me in thanking the teams around the organisation for continuing to, to provide the care that they provide uh, under, this, under pressure. Um, Alison mentioned radiotherapy, that's coming along at pace. If board members haven't been to uh, have a go and have a look, it's, it's just starting to become exciting. So please do feel free to wander around by the Cancer Centre. Expectation is that that will be finished in spring, and I choose my words carefully, mm -hmm. spring 2024, and uh, that will be at the earliest April. Great job. Um, so that's a very positive progress on that. Uh, which is good. Um, you 
may see have seen uh, just a bit of positive news around um, the um, decision by the council last night, I think it was last night or the night before, um, on how we are looking to support type 2 diabetics in Milton Keynes. Um, we'll brief separately on that, but I think it's once again that Milton Keynes place working well together and focusing on prevention rather than um, just waiting for people to come into hospital. So I mean, that's a, a good news story. We'll brief on that a bit more detail later on. Um, the one thing that has hit the media um, with some force is Milton. Um, if you haven't heard about Milton, uh, John can describe Milton very beautifully. Over to you, John. Uh, Milton is an autonomous robot that we um, hope to be able to deploy to, to carry out tasks, um, delivery tasks. Um, initially, use cases were looking at drugs between main pharmacy and satellite pharmacy units, but also uh, may well be deployed to take additional um, meals and snacks from the main kitchens towards to top up their supplies. And it has caused a bit of positive news out there, and um, it's not surprising that Milton Keynes is used to having autonomous robots around the plaque, around the patch, uh, so why not in the hospital as well? Keep briefed on that with the next, with the next proposal. Very, very important because it involves cost and coffee. Autonomous robots, so looking forward to that one, as you can tell from the desk. <laughs> uh, finally, you mentioned the networks, Alison, just to say that um, I will be taking over the chair of the Bain Network, um, and I'll be doing. I will do that once I've had the handover from Nikki next week. So I will chair that network from now on. And also, we have given a thousand pounds to each of the staff networks to support them in developing posters and information to ensure we publicise and spread across the organisation. I'll look to my colleagues to see if there's anything exciting that I've missed at this moment in time. It's good, nothing coming in from them. Is that so can I just check, Jake? Did we are you you're the exec lead for the network? Is that right? Yes, sorry, the exec lead, you're right. Yeah. Apology. The exec sponsor, not yeah. the chair. That very well yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I just suddenly thought something had happened and no. I missed it. No, 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 absolutely no. not. You're yeah. yeah, right to pick me up on that. I'm the exec sponsor, not Lovely. the chair. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Moving on then. Um I to make serious incident and learning report. That's with me. So item eight, which in the pack is at page twenty-three. Um, so this is a revised paper. Um, unfortunately, the, the bit about learning, i.e. appreciative inquiry life, which actually was the subject of the patient story um, and also QI training fell off the earlier versions. So there's a new version in the back. Um, this report um, describes the six serious incidents uh, which met the threshold during November and December uh, for us to report externally. Um, so for new colleagues around the table, um, staff report um, all clinical incidents that occur in the organisation. Um, and there's a regular process once a week uh, where we assess those incidents and those which cause significant harm um, and are felt to be avoidable. They reach this serious incident threshold and be reported externally on a framework of slice. There were six incidents. Um, I think you, two of them involved um, the falls of inpatients with resultant harm, um, which is a sadly a relatively common incident across the NHS and we have programmes in place to try and reduce that and clearly these incidents and learning from them feed into those improvement programmes. I think the one incident on here to draw attention to is the second one, which is death of a patient under a section of the Mental Health Act. Again, it's a very um, formal category that when there is a detained patient, so whether that's a prisoner or a patient who's under the Mental Health Act, when they die in an acute hospital, um, that essentially becomes a serious incident. Actually, when we look at this, this particular case, um, there were very complex physical healthcare needs. Um, many teams in this organisation involved, tertiary units also involved. It's far too early to say whether there were um, errors of omission or commission. We will see during the course of investigation. So those are the incidents we've reported. They're all under investigation. In terms of the um, UI side of things, um, I was going to talk about appreciative inquiry life, but we've done that already in the patient story, so I won't. Um, but I would just reference we are training groups of staff in each of the clinical divisions 
um, in what's called QSA, which is Quality Service Improvement and Redesign. It's an NHS sort of standard approach to quality improvement. Um, and we've done training in the past. We're now about to embark on a further wave of that, again, um, targeting divisional teams as we sort of develop the, the, the program. Again, they have other things to add. Um, just well, just to add to QI, so we're working with Yvonne and, and his team, the QI team are supporting these where we've noted trends and concerns in this report. There is a direct correlation to the QI team's work in terms of supporting divisions around improvements um, in those areas to make that link for learning and improvement following incidents. Um, so uh, there's also, I'm just noting on the trends and concerns around reporting rates for incidents, you, some of the board might remember we support our reporting system um, a year ago um, to a new system called Radar, which is also quite a new entry into the health um, care market. Um, and at the same time as that, we were the or on a, the only trust to implement the um, LPSE, the National Learning from Patient Safety Events um, reporting template. And that's caused us some complexity and caused some, some fluctuation in our reporting rates. Um, we're doing quite a lot of work at the moment in redesigning forms and um, our reporting to increase our reporting rate um, and focusing on staff training in different areas as well. Um, although it's it's lower than it's um, than, than we want it to be, it's 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 not far off where it was before we changed the system, which is that we want a higher reporting rate and we want to be able to make sure that we can use um, this new NHS England way of reporting in an effective way that drives learning and improvement um, rather than just reporting for reporting sake. Can I just check? We didn't just decide to go our own way, did we? We we were doing something. That the rest of the NHS is they have to do having it. to do. Yes, we yeah. just we piloted it with NHS England. Yeah. Yes, right. that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions at all on the board? I think Kate, you've answered my question, which was how do we improve the reporting rate and when will we know when, when it's efficient? I think you've just answered that now. Yeah. But just to understand it. So the form was causing people complexities of how to capture the right information and and we're now working with NHS England to yes. improve that. Form. So when we introduced it, it, the way that it's been designed nationally, it's it introduced two boards. So there was two workflows, so it just created more work. Right. So we were amount that we've we've worked with them to amalgamate a form of various different workflows, trying to simplify the number of workflows so that it's not taking because obviously speed is really important when you're reporting an incident. And I think what the um, form was focused on is capturing lots of information, which is great because we want lots of information, but it doesn't necessarily work for people who've got you know, moments to report. So it's just trying to find that balance. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, going on to line then, feedback from Maternity Assurance Group. Thank you, Alison. Um, so we take the report as read. There's um, three or four uh, things to, to highlight here. Um, we had a great deal of discussion with the Manning uh, Maternity Insurance Group on uh, CNXT. There is a more detailed presentation on that today. Uh, we're coming into the end of our uh, report, and there are 10 actions that we need to meet with us. Um, most of our discussion focused around uh, the area that was in Amber, which was our midwifery staffing. And uh, in the presentation later on, we will um, articulate how we've resolved that uh, particular problem. Um, the other issue to, to make highlight is focuses around the connectivity in uh, with our community midwives. Um, and what this means is that in, in particularly in the rural villages, um, we have a, a, an issue with e-care in that they, they can't con record their notes in a, in a, a contemporaneous way. And, and sometimes they're having to do that retrospectively and it, it's to do with um, the networks. So there's a great deal of um, work that's ongoing with the information team to try and resolve those uh, issues. Um, the other area that we had a great deal of discussion about was uh, access to obstetric theatres, and we've asked the, there's a very clear understanding about how that's managed um, within the maternity team. We've asked for a more developed soft to come back to the maternity assurance group uh, to address the meeting. And then um, lots of folks will know that we have um, implemented the BSOFs uh, um, approach. This is the, the Birmingham symptoms specific triage process, and it's about um, pregnancy related complications and concerns. We've implemented that um, over several months and we've asked for a more detailed evaluation of what that looks like in terms of what's been very successful in that approach and what are the areas that we need to focus on in the future. 
Thanks, Martha. Thank you. Any questions at all? Thank you. I mean, just to, I'm not only involved in the um, maternity assurance group, but then there's um, a huge amount of work. It's just to acknowledge the enormous amount of work that's gone on um, actually in, in the department. Um, just one thing, I suppose, is just the, some of the acronyms. We keep coming back to this if it's possible to have just it written out first and then the acronym in, in brackets would be great, particularly when we have a meeting in public, just so that people understand what we're referencing. So thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, Going on then to item 10, infection prevention and control. Yeah. Um, so I'm feeling very positive now because the infection prevention control breaks IPC report. <laughs> so page 33 of the pack, um, item number 10. Um, so this is an annual report covering 21 22. So clinically a little bit dated at this point. It's been through the appropriate cycle and gone to trust and yes. committee and quality and risk committee. Um, this report um, looks at a number of different things. It looks at the rates of Clostridium difficile infection, which is a essentially infectious here, which can be deadly. Um, it looks at um, bloodstream infections, particularly with Staph aureus, which is um, again one of the more concerning bloods to have folks to have in your bloodstream. The report goes on to look at some of the learning, and obviously, given the years we've been in, it talks about COVID and other folks. COVID. In the report, there is discussion around sort of if they're not targets, they're sort of thresholds or, or sort of goals that we as an organisation try and achieve each year. So we try and achieve less than a certain number in each of these types of infections. I think it's really important to point out those numbers are somewhat arbitrary. They are stretching, i.e. over the years we've agreed those with our commissioners and they've come down year on year. In the background, our rates of all of these infections are lower than national and regional, regional averages. So we don't have a specific infection control problem issue at MKUH. That said, with those arbitrary thresholds, we have exceeded quite a few of them over the last each year. So for example, we had 13 cases of C dip when the threshold was 10, um, and 10 cases of Staph aureus bacteremia when the um, threshold was five. Um, part of it's because those things are arbitrary. I think also part of it is in relation to recovery from COVID and the increased acuity in the different patient mix we saw with over the course of that. The report talks about COVID clusters and outbreaks. There were several of those, um, as you would imagine, and as we spoke about at the time, um, on account of COVID, each one of those was investigated appropriately with the input of the regional infection prevention control team. Um, and generally speaking, the regional team were very supportive both of the decisions we were making locally um, and, and the care that was being provided. I think one thing I would draw attention on here too is the hip and knee data. So towards the back of the report, there is um, information about surgical site surveillance when patients have hip replacements and, and knee operations. And establishments of the board will, be, will, will recall that we are nationally an outlier for revision rates within 10 years of having a hip replacement. And, and joint infection is one of the big things which drives revision rates. So <laughs> we're conscious that. Um, Infection of hip joints has historically been a bit of an issue in, in the organisation, um, not so much recently. I think this data in particular is really reassuring. It talks about 288 hip and knee operations with only one case of infection, which is, is very good indeed. There's only part of the data picture, but it's been useful now. Just a final comment, and I, I mentioned this at the um, quality committee as well. Um, the Director of Infection Prevention and Control portfolio I'm currently holding following up to Nikki, the previous chief nurse. Um, this report is for last year. When I read through this report, it's a really interesting report and it's sort of quite educational about infection prevention and control issues. But when I look at it, I want rather than narrative, I sort of want more focus on what our processes are, what's our performance, what's our learning. Um, and I'll be working with the team and, and with Bob as well um, to try and yeah, reformat it in that direction. All of that said, of course, that I suspect will be from April 23. It'll yeah, be another 15 months before we see that report here. Thank you very much. Any questions at all? Just sorry, with regards to the surgical site patients, has, there, has that previously tied in with a change in protocols around prophylaxis, perhaps? So, so I think so, so it's, a, it's a long story, and we will definitely we can definitely have a conversation at some point. But in terms of being an outlier historically for hip replacements and, and, and revisions. Um, it's very complicated accessing data from the National Joint Registry has been remarkably challenging. 
Um, but the key thing we did probably about four years ago um, was move to having a ring fence unit in orthopedics, whereas previously we had a elected one with more ring fence. Um, and you know, that in, in conjunction with lots of surgical attention to, we didn't necessarily identify particular issues in the past, but much more attention and focus to, to the Burbo pathway. And we've done better in our, in our two dedicated arthroplasty theatres as well. So there's more two interventions, but it takes an awful long time for a 10 year outlier status to wash out of the data, particularly when the denominator has been so low for the last couple of years with COVID and very few elective patients. Thank you. Just a little bit as well, um, is or a couple of things. One is, um, the, the rates that we that you say are slightly arbitrary, but we you know we talk to commissioners and things like that. I mean, obviously, apart from the impact it has on the patient, which we want to avoid, are there other ramifications for the organisation in terms of, of exceeding those? Um, so, so I think the ramifications these days for the organisation would be seen as a, an outlier when benchmarked against other organisations, mm -hmm. rather than when benchmarked against locally green slightly arbitrary targets. Or um, there used to be uh, fines for cases of MRSA from memory, uh, those have not been active in just many years. So, so, so no, but I go back to your original point, any, any case of a avoidable bacteremia is a proper problem. So yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I know there's a manual coming out of this part of the thing um, to sort of have a, a set approach for the country. It's a national infection prevention control manual. Uh, quite, quite possibly, there's all sorts of industry. And, so. Yeah, I know. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That's noted. Thank you very much. Um, the pressure answers quarterly update. Um, so just before we start up to the discussion around this, um, I'm going to uh, summarise this around five con um, confounding um, variables. So the <coughs> lens with which we read these numbers, we need to be really cautious about, and it's because of these uh, five variables. So the first one I'm going to talk about is about the validation and the over-reporting of uh, pressure damage in our organisation. Um, typically, RNs will report uh, that a, um, a, 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 a what looks like a blister, essentially, as a, as a category two, and they're often um, moist regions. And the way we manage and clean that data is it requires a review by the tissue viability team um, uh, at, within 48 hours of the, identify, uh, the identification. Um, our tissue viability team is extremely vulnerable in the sense that it's quite small. It has less than three whole kind equivalents and it has been uh, impacted on maternity leave, long term sickness absence that's related to bereavement. So their ability to do that 48 hour validation process um, has completely uh, been uh, compromised. Um, they have tried in, in parts to do that via um, photography but that's quite different that's quite difficult with category two because they, they a, a moisture region and a category two uh, pressure ulcer look almost exactly the same what's different is the parameters around the the outside one looks like a butterfly and the other one has a, 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 a kind of a, a border around it um so that's increasing our, our levels of category two the error rate is, is will be roughly between um 20 to 25 percent in the over reporting which is known about for um um, uh, about a, a couple of months. So we're trying to, to deal with that at the moment. So that's that's one lens to, to have a look at. The other thing is we're reporting all of our DTIs as DTIs and um, we need a, a, a revised process for that. So going forward in future papers, what you will see them represented as is suspected DTIs. So DTIs are the deep tissue injuries for, for um, uh, is the term that we use. They look a lot like blood blister. Um, but the reason why we keep them in a separate category is because uh, we can't tell what category they fit into. It requires a bit of time before you can determine that. And again, we haven't had that review process. So it, need, it, it means you record it as a suspected DTI and then you track and follow that particular um, uh, pressure ulcer until you can either categorise it or it drops off in that it, it heals or disappears. So they're, they're quite an interesting category. They can be they can be hide, hiding a, a big problem or no problem uh, at all. So that process, we're starting to um, understand better and have a more rigorous and robust one. Um, in terms of uh, the shift from JTEX to radar, that again affected how we report pressure damage. We have three separate spreadsheets that's recording them and with different individuals interacting, um, all of which are coming up with different numbers. There's an enormous uh, deep dive that's going on at the moment to have a 
absolutely crystal clear process for how we record this on radar and update once the tissue viability team have been in to, to have a look and, and validate the, the category. So, so that's a, another piece of work that's ongoing. Um, the introduction of the new beds, uh, we introduced a, a really a good bed called the Ariaflex. Um, and it's quite an advanced, it's an advanced what you call a sem semi-dynamic support. So every patient will go onto this particular type of um, yeah. mattress. Where we go into intermediate and more detailed support, that is a bit more complicated. So we've had to revise the training. It requires our nurses to think more carefully about what settings that we use on those beds, um, depending on uh, the condition of the individual uh, patient. That's all ongoing, and there are competencies um, on all of those beds that are being rolled out at the moment. Um, so brilliant in its non-powered, what we call the non-powered mode, which is without the box at the bottom, but into the box at the bottom, it becomes a bit more complicated to deal with. Um, the other thing that we're not capturing in here in this paper, and what you'll see in future data reporting is that we, we will be reporting this by per thousand bed days. Um, because what we can see is the impact that um, the increased use of escalation beds is having on the figures. Um, for example, we have more than 90 open at the moment, and we're not seeing that reflected or clearly uh, reflected in these numbers. And reporting per thousand bed days will allow us to do that more meaningfully. And then we've got the winter and seasonal variations. So um, the, it's quite a detailed report. You'll see there's quite a, a detailed improvement plan. So it is about data. It is about improving our management of the bed. Uh, there is very, there's a, a new um, education package that's for all registered like HDAs. That's in the, the progress of being um, rolling out. And um, they're the main points I'd probably like to raise. Great, thanks. thanks. Any questions? There's a lot of work I know going on around this area. We have discussed it before. before. Um, just one thing I wanted to ask actually is just that I noticed there was a reference to uh, identifying some of these and there were eight safeguarding issues, um, which now I just wanted to be clear is that was people coming in from the community. So there were issues around um, the care of those individuals. Is that right? So the, the eight that we've reported here are the ones that, that belong to us. So these are where um, we look at, we look systematically at, at any kind of care deficits that might uh, be associated right. with pressure damage and put in really robust improvement plans to support that. Okay. Again, Alison, we're over reporting them. Yeah. Um, we have, so uh, in many ways, we're better off over reporting, but, but it's giving us a confusing picture. So, yeah. uh, so our, uh, we do have a tendency to significantly over-report which we're trying to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Gary, yes. Hi, Yvonne. Thank you for the report. It was very helpful. Um, I've got one observation which I think you touched on uh, in your um, as you ran through the report, and that is that for me it was a bit difficult to get a sense of the impact of volumetrics on how they drive um, uh, some of the um, incidents that you report on, you know, such as, you know, the, the, uh, the you know, the throughput in the hospital at the moment, enhanced waiting lists in ED. So it's a little bit difficult for me to see whether some of the trends were, were a result of where the hospital is, the winter, those kind of factors. Uh, you know, so I just would appreciate you expanding on that a little bit. It's an observation. I think you may have mentioned it. And the second thing is there's clearly lots of really good analysis going on as to what's causing these things. But I just wanted also to hear your your view on um, where you think things may be going, you know, what your expectation is, uh, where you see some of these trends, uh, you know, what can we expect to see in the data, take on board your points about the data and getting uh, better information, but what trends do you expect to see over the next sort of six months? Is that clear, Yvonne? Sorry if it's yeah, a bit... It is, it is. Um, and I touched on that. So how we present this data will be different, Gary. And so what we're going, it won't be this just this crude number. It will be, be by per thousand bed days. And that allows us to mitigate for, we've got a lot of escalation beds. It gives us that fuller picture. We're in winter. It will allow us to map and actually to compare with other organisations. So I'll, I'll be on um, the model model hospital to look at how do we compare about uh, with other organisations at this time of year, uh, and we'll be able to give you a better steer on that when I when I have that 
uh, data. The other thing we're going to put in is, um, and we're working on that, is we, we will have SPC charts. So we'll be able to see when we've got special cause improvement and when we've got um, special cause concern. So you can expect to see that from a from a data point of view. Your your other question uh, uh, right, that uh, that will capture the the winter and seasonal um, uh, variations and what kind of interventions are best at that particular time. In terms of the QI program, there is a defined metric. So we are we are looking in the next six months to cut these figures in half. Um, so when I report, it'll be a report against that's the target. Does that answer your second question? Thank you. Okay, you're on. You're on. Here goes. That's fine. Okay, we need to. We need to move on. Thank you very much for that. So we'll see how this evolves, and obviously um, review it um, as we go along. So thank you. Um, going on then to the maternity. Am I? Yes, that's right. Maternity clinical negligence being for trust. So we, have, so we have. Um, we have Melissa. Oh, Melissa's there. Now, Melissa. Here. Um, hello, Hi. Andy as well. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Hello. Oh. Yeah, morning everybody. So Nandini and I are going to um, give a very short uh, run through on CNST. So I'm Melissa, I'm the Head of Midwifery at the Trust. I'm Nandini Gupta, um, Obzin Gynae Consultant and Clinical Director. Do excuse me, I'm in the middle of a gynae clinic, so Melissa is going to do the presentation. <laughs> Thanks Nandini, don't worry. So just to give a little bit of history first and an explanation around what CNST is, this is a clinical negligence scheme for trust and the maternity incentive scheme is applicable to all trusts who um, provide maternity care. So we have to pay a certain amount into the maternity incentive scheme to provide the maternity premium and that creates the incentive fund. And then all trusts are asked to have 10 safety actions in place. The paper did come out um, detailing all of the different 10 safety actions which have associated actions within them. And what we have to do is be able to demonstrate compliance with all these 10 safety actions. If we achieve compliance, then we get a rebate on the incentive uh, premium that we paid. If you don't achieve all the 10 actions, you have to have an action plan in place for any of the ones you don't achieve and then you will be assessed and they will review how much financial support they will give you to be compliant with those actions. So within the pack there is a presentation that gives a run through of all the 10 safety actions and touches on the evidence that we are submitting around compliance with those. In addition to that there are some quite significant evidence folders for each of the actions now, the evidence folders are almost complete, but you may notice from the pack that the reporting period on some of the actions has not yet finished. The reason why it's coming to board today is because as part of the sign off process, they have changed what we need to do for CNST moving forward. So it has to come to trust board. It has to be signed off by the CEO and the accountable officer for the ICB. And it also is reviewed by the local maternity and neonatal system, which is happening on the 23rd of January. We will go through all the evidence files because in addition to what we as a trust have to report internally and externally, the local maternity and neonatal service system also have to support report to the ICB and they have to provide the evidence of those reports. Um, I won't go through every single action. We're obviously very happy to answer questions on any of the actions. One that I will just draw your attention to is safety action five, which at the time of doing the uh, presentation was not compliant because one of the criteria of safety action five is that you have to uh, demonstrate through trust board minutes that there is an agreement to fund to the birth rate plus establishment. So we had a birth rate plus done in 2018 uh, and we are funded to that establishment and over that establishment following Ockenden uh, review. We then had a repeat birth rate plus done in 2020 21, right at the end of 21 and it is recommended that you have it repeated every three years 
the difference between our current funded establishment and the 2021 birth rate plus establishment is six whole time equivalent midwives. And in the event that you're not funded to that, there needs to be an action and a time frame around how you will achieve the funding. Subsequent to submitting this, uh, I did submit a paper to Yvonne and there has been a discussion um, at the exact director's meeting and there is a commitment to around the principle of the timeframes associated with the uh, uplift in the funded establishment. It is also worth mentioning that we do currently have vacancy within our current funded establishment and the absolute priority for us is recruiting to that vacancy to be able to support the overall delivery of care. Happy to answer any other questions. Thanks very much, Melissa. Thank you. I know we, we have um uh, had the items to the board several times um, over the last year or so, so hopefully colleagues are all very familiar with this. Um, but I think for today, it's really just a note, obviously the, the progress and everything as well, but as you say, it's um, as well to get the, the board um, agreements as recommended by the exec committee that um, uh, once we get the funded establishment that we, we need already, um, then there will be the commitment to to have the extra under the birth rate plus. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Um, any questions or comments before I ask the board to pick that agreement? Yeah. Great, absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the board uh, agrees with that um, wholeheartedly. So thank you. And um, thank you, Melissa, and everybody um, in the team for all the enormous amount of work that's been going on to produce um, you know, all these reports, but the work that's behind that as well. So thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. See you again. Great. OK, so that's approved and we will then go on to item 13, complaints and patients from the quarterly reports. Thank you. Uh, there's two papers. Um, one is the uh, quarterly complaints update, uh, which contains our complaints uh, figures. And you can see that there is the number of more complaints that are coming through. The complaints team have a performance indicator where um, they want to convert most of those complaints into um, in born, uh, to be informally resolved, and when, and when they can't do that, that performance looks like it's declined because it's more of them are being dealt with as formal complaints. Sometimes that's simply due to the complexity of the complaint that's coming, it's not able to be dealt with within 24 hours. Um, the themes for complaints are um, similar um, to um, the themes we've seen before um, appointment issues, particularly um, care, communi uh, yeah, care and communication. We've tried really hard to appoint into the post um, as a pilot as a dedicated complaints um, or some signposting officer in the patient um, experience team to deal with those patients that call in with a kind of concern around their appointment. We find it really hard to appoint a skilled member of staff into that role. We're going to keep um, trying. That's because they're, they're quite pressured themselves in, in the booking team. Uh, skills are of much demand, uh, but we'll keep trying to do that. We have done a lot of work over the last um, couple of months in stabilising the um, workforce in and complaints and powers we've appointed into um, a couple of additional roles to provide them with some more support to enable us to really um, take, you know, to provide a really good statutory service um, and um, be able to free the team up also to develop their skills as well because they are a team that are keen to develop. Um, have you seen any questions otherwise on um, this report? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any, any questions? Yeah, I suppose just, uh, just something that board should note is the um, as waiting times increase, there, there's a very clear correlation between the numbers of patients phoning up, complaining, raising concerns about uh, the length of time waiting. And that is then, it, it exacerbates any issues in relation to communication with the organisation. So we definitely, in a, through my office and through the, the team we are, we are seeing an increase. A lot of it is driven by increased waiting time. I think to a certain extent, we just that, that is a fact of life at the moment. This is how we handle that, I guess. Um, Hayden? Thanks, Kate. Um, I, did, I did a bit of research when um, on the point of radar not being able to reopen complaints because I thought that was a bit weird. It sounded like something quite straightforward. Turns out NHS Somerset use radar and they can yeah, yeah. reopen. So yes. I don't know if it's worth. So we were in touch with them and we're going to a radar, um, well I'm not going, but my risk manager and some of the team are going to a, a day with radar on the 18th um, to unpick some of these user issues. 
Some of it is the way we configured the system. So some of it like, we do baked in to how we do it for whatever reason. We're also going through complaints because we've got a lot of sort of different systems, FFT, PEP, radar, and we're going to redesign them so that they are all themed in the same way. So whenever you look at one thing, the themes are the same. So we can pull out really good comprehensive thematic review for each area. So the moment it's just too disparate. So that work is ongoing as well. I think that's some really great work. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great stuff. And ultimately, hopefully, you know, it can be so really very efficient and easy to use, and we can follow some really good data. Any, any other questions? Thank you very much. So that's noted. Thank you. Um, and then patient and family experience quarterly report. Thank you. This is always my favourite report because it's um, got lots of lovely things in it. Um, so um, obviously, the, the patient experience platform. Um, we have um, agreed that we will renew um, that for uh, next year. The platform is changing um, and to enable us to do this some of this thematic work and also to be able to just do a bit more in-depth work in, um, in how we analyse and use the feedback. Because it's a huge wealth of information that's coming into the organisation. We really need to be able to find how that's used internally. So that's our aim for the next three months, really to be able to drive that data and improvement plan, plan link it to the different improvement work, you know, be able to really promote areas that are doing well. Um, so really excited about that. Um, and then obviously in here captures different work in different areas. So for some of the volunteers work, we're going to renew our volunteers strategy and look at how we want to use volunteers in the organisation over the next couple of years. Um, there's some updates here as, as well from the different groups, meaningful activities, um, the um, armed forces covenant work, um, and also some of the um, assessments that go on. So things like place. Um, but again, in, in having a, a lot of work going on with things like place, um, 15 steps program, quality reviews that we do, just trying to bring it all together and make sure that we're not overburdening different areas, make sure that each of these things have a really defined purpose and an output and loop back into the organisation. So there's just a little bit of going through that and making sure that we're using all of our resources in the most effective way. Um, I don't want to have to say any questions on this. Um, not really a question, but just a comment. I think uh, I was quite impressed to know the meaningful activities within the data. I think that's an amazing role to have in the trust. Um, but I was I wondered what what the criteria is, or is there what the process is for uh, someone to be able to access the meaningful activities within the data? And with just one role being developed across the trust, is that something that um, is, uh, is there is a wait in time, or how how do people access that? So, the, so it's so the uh, so the meaningful activities coordinator does proactive work on all of the wards. So it goes and visits wards to find out patients who might benefit from from her um, input, and also is able to be called on by the wards as well. We, you know, we found the charities funded this um, role as a, as a pilot role, um, and the impact on patient experience has been really, really. I think it's significant actually, hasn't it? From what we've seen. Um, so we, I think it's a model that we'd want to look at how we might extend and expand in the future. Is there, is there any data available on, on yes. that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you can yeah. share yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just coincidentally, um, we had a discussion at exams on Tuesday and agreed that whilst the charity has opted to fund it to date, that we would as an organisation fund this in the future. So we have it determined. Yeah, no, I think it's, and we, we've had some interesting uh, reports from the board around the impact, so it's just, I mean, it's, it's marvellous. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you for the case. Um, uh, 15 is, we don't have an item. In fact, well, we've finished slightly early. If colleagues are happy, we could break now and come back at half past. yeah, yeah. I think that's what I'm saying.
Watch later. Another report from 21 and 22. I think just in terms of context, it's we think the last few years have been interesting with pandemics and wars and other things. Just to take ourselves back to 2019, Dame Sally Davis, who was the outgoing chief medical officer, um, said we were in an arms race against microbes. And unless we sorted ourselves out in relation to antimicrobial resistance, which is um, essentially bacteria becoming resistant to our antibiotics, there will be 10 million avoidable deaths a year by 2050. So it's, it's a big agenda and, and, and a global issue. That's the sort of wider context. And then these are our efforts on description of 21 22 um, to ensure we have a grip, i.e., a stewardship about our use of, of um, the broad spectrum antibiotics. And by that, I mean antibiotics that treat lots and lots of different rather than ones that are very focused on treating. It's those broad spectrum antibiotics um, that allow um, microbes to evade antibiotics um, and become more complex. This report talks about all sorts of things. It talks about the staffing challenges we've had in this area. So, um, ideally, antimicrobial stewardship is something that is owned by everybody, but is led by microbiologists and pharmacists. Um, and our antimicrobial pharmacist. Um, was supposed to be had vacant for a year or so and real difficulties recruiting too. We have now recruited and have an excellent colleague Lauren in the dose 
um, clearly COVID, the, the patient group and, and the disease that is COVID has had an impact around antimicrobial stewardship. Um, most hospitalized patients got antibiotics, even if it's a virus, because super added bacterial infection was a, was a problem. So that would have changed um, the figures of the In terms of our performance, if we look at Milton Keynes at our total daily basis of antibiotics, um, it is a bit volatile because of the numbers of patients with case mix. Um, but essentially, we are below, i.e., in a good way, we're just below the national average. So again, we don't have a we don't sort of stand out as a problem in Milton Keynes, but equally too many antibiotics are used across the wider United Kingdom. Very specifically, when you look at the broad spectrum antibiotic clinical uh, penning model, which is an example of carbon penning, again, we're below the national average, which is good. Um, there's a fascinating slide here about Tazosin, tip, which I'd say actually Tazosin is a trade name, um, but an antibiotic which, um, again, is very broad spectrum, where, where rates of usage have dropped very dramatically across the country. Um, and they dropped dramatically across the country because there were worldwide supply problems because of China, where it's all made. Um, so that wasn't sort of a, an active intervention. It was us coping with the supply problem. The one other thing I'd point out here is just the, the, the results of an investment decision we made a few years ago. Um, so we bought for the microbiology service something called a Molditon. Um, and essentially, in the old days, you take a sample and it would take um, certainly 24 hours, possibly some days, before you know what knew what bugs were growing in that sample. Um, and when you knew what bugs were growing in the sample, you could tailor your antibiotics more appropriately. Molditon essentially is a, is a system that gives us a head start on that in terms of sequencing bugs that may be in the sample. So you know at four, six hours what you're dealing with, rather than having to couple of days. And that head start, I think, is, is a significant part of the improvements. So, um, generally positive position, but still not all work to do. Thank you very much. Any questions for both, as you say, a very important area? Um, just just a, one, one oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, in ter terms of this and reporting, and obviously, I think, is there anything that we are doing currently around patient expectations? Because obviously, again, the, the pressure that you then put on additional clinicians that see them, see them prescribing. So, yeah. So, so I think that there is certainly an argument to bring patients into this discussion. Um, many years ago when hand hygiene was a real challenge for the NHS, there was lots of discussion about actually encouraging the patient to advocate for themselves and ask the doctor whether they wash their hands, et cetera. And, and the same is true about antimicrobial stewardship. So I think that there is a role for making sure that all of our patients know what they're being given and why at all times, rather than sort of being passive recipients. The first step for us in this organization is moving to a position where um, it doesn't require a doctor to stop an antibiotic or change an antibiotic from intravenous to oral. Um, at the moment, uh, that is still uh, doctor-driven and led. Uh, and I want to, over the course of this year, with colleagues, want to empower a culture whereby um, nurses and pharmacists are empowered to um, stop or down brain antibiotics. So that would be the first area, but I agree the patient voices. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a, a, a small point of a story or thing that um, we haven't got anything about Milton Keynes Hospital on the report. We don't know. Yeah, so if we, just that we know that it's ours, um, would be great. And uh, uh, a cover sheet yeah. just goes for a couple of things on the agenda as well. No cover sheets, so that would be really helpful because it does guide us as to what's required of us. But this is just for no team, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you. And thanks to all the work that's gone into uh, compiling this as well, getting all the information to go into huge. Thank you very much. Um, going on to 17 then, performance report. Thank you, Alison. Um, it was included in the pack, included the overview and cover sheets onto 17, and the appendices scorecard and performance reports have actually been put in the appendices this month, just to draw people's attention to that. Um, as Joe mentioned earlier, we've had a pressure of winter. Um, this report refers to November, so crossing our minds back. That probably was the beginning of the winter surge, although we don't really see it dropping across the year. Our emergency activity continued to increase um, in November, and we actually saw a slight deterioration in our AME performance against the national four annual target. We, in reality, as the papers refer to, still holding that national position compared to everybody else, but it was it was our worst month in year. Similarly, the challenges we faced in November are ambulance handover position, again retaining solid position nationally, um, was challenged and we saw our lowest performance in year. Um, that 
reflected our hospital clearly where our metrics around super stranded and what we called our non criteria to reside patients. Um, we had around 60 patients still within the hospital at that point where we deemed they could be um, positioned somewhere else and shouldn't have been in hospital. Our outpatient attendances again increased in November. Um, our challenges still at the moment are delivering the virtual activity that we should be doing um, in clinic um, deliveries and also our, our DMAs. We've got some particular pressure points that we're seeing that go up rather than, than come down. From an elective position with the increasing um, emergency pressures, we've continued to sustain an elective programme, um, but it's been challenged and we have had in recent months and weeks clearly challenging days where it's just been the um, cancers and urgents that we've seen, again reflecting the national position. Um, but from a cancer perspective, we've talked about this internally this week, it's sort of on a quarterly position, we closed that down, we've just closed down November's reporting and we've done very well in terms of achieving the 31 day performance and the 28 day performance, even though we're still struggling very much with the two week wait demand at the beginning of the pathway. Mm. Um, but let's not forget that we've seen an increase in about 100 patients a month this year compared to previous years, so we've definitely seen pressures in there. Um, in terms of the standard scorecard, just to draw yourself to um, the attention of, as Ian reported earlier, in terms of infection control and IPC, this year, in eight months, we have reached a number of the standards arbitrary as Ian described, but just drawing your attention to already this year, our MRSAs have gone to two over a threshold of zero. Uh, our MSSA infections are at 13 above a target of eight, and our CD position um, is 14 against a challenging number. We set ourselves at 10 at the beginning of the year. We've also breached our SI threshold um, in this month as well. So I suppose just one final point to conclude the current position, um, and Edouard has mentioned in the webinar with this this morning, we still have 18 between, we've had between 80 and 100 escalation beds since the end of December, in between December and New Year. Um, we opened more escalation capacity. Uh, it has limited, obviously, our activity, but we're doing well to try and, and mitigate that and close down the beds as best we can. The staffing numbers continue to be a sort of Achilles heel, and again, that's seen no difference. You see, you'll come onto the workforce report, um, and we know where our turnover numbers are providing us with a challenge. Uh, sickness over the winter period has also been a challenge to maintain that. So we've escalated the number of beds, we've stretched the staffing and resource further, which um, inevitably leads to a challenging position where on some days we've seen over 100 sort of what we call medical outliers, which are patients outside the medical bed base, which they're funded for, that the doctors and nurses are stretching to cover. So again, I echo my thanks to all the teams involved both clinical and non-clinical over this winter period. It's been a challenge. As we have um, mentioned, our ambulance strike impact yesterday was relatively negligible um, because SCAS was not on uh, strike and therefore we've maintained the position that we're currently in. But again, another challenging month. I'm happy to pick up any questions. Yeah. Sorry, it's a, it's a very slightly immaterial correction. This guy's were on strike. It's just only two percent right. of the workforce was in the relevant unit. Oh right. Yes. Okay. So, oh right. Question. Not just locally. Yeah. 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 Yeah
which we'll be talking about a little bit later today. But were your were the key areas that you would point us to? Is that an area, or is that just uh, a function of the pressures the hospital's under at the moment and is more seasonal? So the elective challenge we have to the organisation by the end of March is to clear all the long-standing patients over 78 weeks. We don't discreetly report that in this, but it's a subset of that RTT cohort yeah. and the compliance against the operational planning and then there's changes as Terry will allude to going into next year. But I think that the subset of elective pressures, we need to very much keep our eye on um, as an operational team. We can bring back more detail to the board if that's needed in future months. We have 196 patients currently sitting over 78 weeks. Um, the majority of those 92 are sitting in, sorry, 95 are sitting in ophthalmology and 56 of those are in orthopaedics. So the challenge is to those two specialties whereby we are making some detailed plans and some additional interventions post Christmas now to um, clear those long waiting patients. But as a subset, the elective care pathway um, is definitely where we need to be focusing as well as we see it across the board really and I think you will see the subsequent reporting on the diagnostics has become more of a challenge so in this month we report a very steady increase in terms of the um, under six weeks where from where we started in April at the beginning of this year but I know subsequent months over Christmas have been more challenging as well. I, I think it's probably keeping our eye on all of it other than specifics but there's a lot in there to yeah, that was excellent, Emma, and particularly helpful to hear about the interventions. Yeah, um, I suppose the other thing that we keep touching on as a board is that we have invested significant amounts of money in order to keep on top of the increasing numbers of patients coming through our organisation. Yeah, that investment was done on the back of the financial regime that was set out at the start of the year. And for those newer board members, the, the extent of that financial investment was, and I'm going to look at Terry and going to say 10 million pounds. <laughs> I was going to say 13, uh, Harrison inflation. <laughs> let's, let's stick to 10, it's a nice round eight figure number. So we put 10 million pounds into the organisation um, over and above our baseline in order to increase physical capacity. And we find ourselves in one of only two, perhaps three, but normally two organisations across the whole of the East of England that are delivering above performance targets in terms of numbers of patients treated. So everything that Emma said around reducing patients' waiting times and so on um, is now being considered in the context of a financial regime that has unilaterally being changed by the centre, and I choose my word carefully there, such that we are not going to get paid extra money for treating these extra patients. And so we are having some very difficult conversations internally about how much money we continue to invest in treating extra patients when there appears to be no sign of us getting the money back for treating those patients. And that is a difficult conversation to have internally, as you can imagine, because as soon as we take money out of our services, our waiting times are likely to grow. But ultimately, we can't break the bank. Um, so I'm, I'm still sort of struck by Gary's question. It was, a, it was an excellent question, but not very specific, and I, and I feel I have to give an answer. When I look at the performance report, um, 4.4, the RTT total open pathways is the one I'm worried about. So we've got you know, 40,000 patients roughly on our pathways now. We had 30,000 at the beginning of the year. That's an awful lot of demand that we'll be dealing with one way or another. So that, that's sort of the leading indicator. Or, or not, based on yeah, what you said about the money. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the dichotomy that we face as an organisation, uh, which is do we continue to invest in additional capacity because of, as Ian highlights, that 40,000? Or do we say, hang on a second, the financial regime isn't doing what it said it was going to do, and we can't spend taxpayers' money at risk. So it's, it's a really difficult one. Thank you very much. OK, lots of uh, further conversations over the next few months. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for that.
Oh, Gary, sorry. I was, was just going to say, I, I take on board Joe's point and um, and Ian, thanks for the update. And I think it will be useful to have a look at the financial planning context that, uh, you know, uh, I think we're going to discuss a little bit later in terms of the regime we're moving into and the targets that are being set and how they're tied together. And I think it'd be useful to have that that discussion in that context as well, looking beyond the current year and into, into next year. Um, which I believe Terry's going to talk about a little bit later, if I understand. Yes, yeah, it's on the agenda, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And we're going on then to MKD. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I'm proposing to go through this. I'm, I'm expecting that people will have seen the slides and read them. And I think uh, what I am interested in is questions from the non execs and execs, of course, always welcome, um, on key issues within this. Please. Any questions on the MK deal? Um, thanks, Joe. I mean, the slides are really um, definitely straightforward. I was, I was just wondering, how will we ensure that people outside of MK, and I know we talked about this before, and you said it was a very small amount of people, but nevertheless, I think it's about 10 or so. Um, how we ensure that people outside MK um, that use our services alongside others in a wider area, not to this advantage, by our focus on it. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. So to start with, um, when we look at how the organisation functions, we um, we very rarely, and there is a hesitation there, we very rarely differentiate between Milton Keynes patients and those patients coming to access our services from elsewhere. The reason I say very rarely is that occasionally we will ask our ICS colleagues to support us in ensuring that MK patients are able to access services at this hospital um, if we are receiving too many referrals from out of the area. Um, so we do ask them to restrict or support us restricting access to non-MK patients at times. That is very rare and tends to be almost subspecialty specific. And we do say that we are in most instances very happy to enable our access should the funding be forthcoming from those out of area, um, out of area places. So that's that's the first thing as an organization i think we are relatively comfortable saying that and therefore as a place if we are focused on making sure that we function efficiently as a place then all of our patients who are accessing services here should benefit from it uh, whether that's making sure we move patients out of the hospital faster or whether we're doing some interesting innovative things with our council Again, there should be a benefit to all the patients that access MK UH. It's not an easy one to test. Um, you, you need to keep an eye on. In the same way that we keep an eye on um, how patients with protected characteristics are able to access our services and whether we disadvantage any of them, those patient groups is something we need to keep on the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I think we have to recognise it is an imperfect world. And for example, there are some services provided by community services that perhaps you would be able to access if you were in the best of the first community services might not exist if you live in North Buckinghamshire. And so there are some patients who would regard this as their local hospital uh, for acute care, but for the community who they would be in somebody else's catchment area with a different range of services and options. And so it is, I think, just better to recognise it is a and, and I suppose just on the back of that, there's been a huge amount of work to do away with place code prescribing nationally. What John has referenced there is is some of the legacy issues associated with that. Interestingly, I, I think just thinking of the system as well, you know, certainly for Bedford Hospital and for the Luton and Dunstable, I, mean, I think similar issues arise there as well with, with, with specific councils and then other people accessing the hospitals from other council areas and that sort of thing. So actually it's one I'll note, um, Hayden, because I think it might be interesting to 
I will take this back into my system meetings um, as something to to I suppose be <coughs> cognizant of in terms of people not getting the same sort of treatment opportunities across our system as well as locally. Uh, ben. I'm not sure if you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Great. My um, speaker had become detached and I had to scramble under the desk to sort it. So I'm glad <laughs> I could see you now. Um, slide deck, great, straightforward, nothing to argue with, all sensible priorities. As with all partnership arrangements, I'm really keen to know who specifically will be held to account and how that process will happen. I'm sorry, I can't hear you at all. <laughs> <laughs> so so there are, uh, <laughs> um, just before I answer that question, what I should have done at the start is say that um, these slides were prepared by uh, Rebecca Green, um, and so I can't take credit for them. Uh, they were done by the support term Kate Lace, um, so I will pass on the comments that they created. Um, in relation to the accountability, I think there are two levels of accountability here. The first is that we as a place are expected to hold ourselves to account and each other to account for delivery against what we are deciding to do. So whether that is um, any of the work streams, it's up to us to challenge each other. We have got a, a, a good, a very good relationship at place. Um, the the hesitation there is that sometimes having good relationships can be a blocker to healthy challenge. And we discussed this uh, only at the last meeting about making sure that we did develop that healthy challenge environment. So there's that level. There is also a requirement to feed in formally to the statutory body that is the integrated care board of which I and Michael are um, members of that board to be held to account at that board. So there are two sort of formal levels, um, if, that, if that answers the question. Yeah, and and what are the consequences of not doing it then? Um, so a flippant response, which I would never be accused of giving you, is, is set out on page 259 where there's a set of footprints which says that there's a sense that we've been going around in circles um, and that level of accountability and challenge from a, a CCG to a place hasn't really delivered change. Um, I think it is up to us to make sure that we do hold ourselves to account and do make changes. Ultimately, we are senior managers spending taxpayers' money and we have to take responsibility for that. Okay. I'll remind you that then, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be we'll be bringing it back. Uh, I just think when the, this will be an agenda item to see how we progress with this. Um, to be fair, Bev, and I think as well there'll be a lot of uh, discussion and um, oversight as well from the system. Um, to make sure that uh, we're delivering on this and ultimately as well, obviously our patients and members of the public, you know, uh, as a foundation trust, we have governors. Uh, it's another area where we can be challenged and held to account as well. So I think there'll be a number of... Yeah, my, my question comes from having worked in either the health system or 30 years in local government or, you know, all of those. I've been those footprints going round and round and round in a circle yeah. until I felt giddy and you know it, I'm always keen to know what's going to be different this time because you yeah. know I flip and of course I know what the consequences are you know things don't change patients don't, don't benefit blah 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 but just <coughs> you know, you're right Joe you know when relationships are, are really strong and good then sometimes the cost of that is not quite so much challenging we have to get over that and and you know really do sort of hold each other to account and challenge people for the greater good don't you Thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah, and mine is more um, something I'd just probably not require an answer to now, but would at some point probably like us to spend a bit of time on or explaining to me is 
Given that money is obviously going to be short, given the or tight, given the potential conversations we just had, and given we're going to talk about workforce shortly and, and the high staff leaving rate and difficulties recruiting people, my question is about priorities and the number of objectives we've got and how they all tie together, because we've got, I, I'm a little bit confused as to, we've got place objectives, we may have ICB objectives, uh, as a hospital, we've got objectives, we've got health priorities that we've set this year. And I think at some point, I'd just like to see how they all kind of come together and, and how they end up with a set of priorities for us. Um, because it's, it, it's a bit difficult for me to see that at the moment, uh, how they distill down to the top five things that we're going to be focusing on. I understand that there's different organisations at play and therefore they will have different objectives. But I would like to see how they they come together so we have a real clarity of purpose around where our money and resources are going. Is that, and it's more an observation rather than a, a question I respect, I, I require an answer to now. Um, I suppose to, to add to that, Gary, I think what's interesting is this week we saw published the um, all charts and costs associated with running the ICS. And so one of the things that we're absolutely looking for, not just here at MK, but across Bedfordshire and Luton, is how we use some of the 15 million pounds that is currently being used to run the ICS to add value in places and in the two different systems. So I think there is a real opportunity there to look at that distribution and, and priority to work. And perhaps it's something as well that we, we you know we can come back to i mean i'm, I'm sure we will <coughs> whether it's at a seminar or something like that but to to really look at all these various objectives um as you say in delivery areas that we have and how they all dovetail together precious yes I, I, for me i think it's just a more of a common um i mean looking at the improving systems though and everything that comes out of out of this integrated um I suppose care system it's really about understanding back, right, peeling it right back and understanding what the operating principles are because when you're looking at risk management and you're looking at shared budgets and shared priorities and all that, it would be really interesting to understand what the operating principles are for the integrated system because you've got different structures in all these hospitals where you're coming up with the improving system flow. So how does that all come together knowing that they, you've got the challenges of different structures, mm. but you have one, I suppose, one goal to improve the system flow with the remits that you want to cover. It would be interesting to see how that how that comes out of, <laughs> out of the out of the actual model. Yeah, I think with the, with the emphasis on um, collaboration and you know, this this cross um, organisation working, I, I, yeah, I think you're right. But there's probably quite a bit to work through um, in terms of where we're all starting from, what systems we're using, and how we pull those together to be effective. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jane, for that. And um, we go now on to the finance report. Terry. Thank you. Um, so the report in the book is the um, Monday number, so that covers the period April through to yeah. November. And if I start with the financial performance of the organisation, so on a cumulative basis for those eight months, we're reporting a deficit of £4 million. Um, that's broadly on plan. Um, we're forecasting achievement of a break-even position at the end of the year, but for reasons that Joe touched upon in previous conversations around costs and investments for clearing the elective backlog, we've got a lot of non-recurrent cost in the organisation that I'm sure when we get onto the planning conversation later on today, we'll get into how we can sustain that investment in the current environment. Um, you'll note when you look at the summary table on page uh, was it 271 of the pack, we are showing a rather large payover spend, so about £7.8 million. And um, there's a couple of big things going on in there. The first one is the cost of that extra investment, I was saying, for capacity, so waiting list initiatives, um, bank enhancement rates, agency engagements to try and maximise the number of hours available in our um, clinical capacity. Um, but we also have within there um, additional costs for the payable that was settled during the year, so September. And obviously, because that wasn't a confirmed funding source at the beginning of the year when we set the plan, that isn't in the standard pay budget. For the whole year, that, that issue is worth about £4 million, so around about two and a half up to month eight, just to put some clarity around that point. Um, the non-pay position, as you see in the, the table, is showing again 
performance tracking broadly to budget. That's sort of masking um, a, a growing number of inflationary pressures that we're feeling as an organisation. So um, rather depressingly, but you'll hear me say repeatedly, whenever we have a big contract that comes up for renewal, whether that's waste collection, linen supply, pretty much anything that comes into the hospital, we're seeing some fairly eye-watering percentage increases in prices for the same supply of goods and services. Um, as we've had contracts expire during the year, things come up for renewal, we have seen quite a lot of price rises um, come our way. And clearly when we get into, again, discussions around next year, the level of inflationary protection we get through a funding settlement is going to be a key um, issue for us to work through and just see whether there's a residual pressure for the hospital, which we, we think will be the case. Um, the income position for the organisation is modestly above plan, as you can see in that summary table. Um, we would have liked that to have been um, significantly above the levels of income that we're reporting, and that links directly to the discussions we were having around the change of tact on the payment for the elective recovery plan. So um, for the benefits of um, new colleagues, when we were given the planning guidance for this year, um, the instruction and guidance given to organisations was you have a, a set capacity plan for the number of um, patients you should be seeing during the year, and at the point that you exceed that plan, there's additional monies that would be paid. Um, the organisation invested in capacity on that basis, and then because of um, the majority of hospitals that weren't hitting those um, activity plans up and down the country, um, NHS England decided to underwrite that risk and just effectively turn that policy into a block payment. So we haven't then had a benefit of additional income flowing into the hospital. So that's that's clearly a key point for us to reflect on going into next year. Um, other things to call out from the report. So um, from a capital perspective, you can see we've spent about £9.7 million, pounds, so just over £8 million a month for those eight months. We will be expecting to see roughly a doubling of that monthly spend between now and the end of the year. Um, we have a large number of capital schemes that are in excess of 100 things that we're doing on that front, some much bigger than others. So, for example, radiotherapy um, is, is the single biggest for this year, alongside um, the inclusion of the Maple Centre. Um, there's a lot of work going with teams and, and um, individual uh, leads for different schemes where we're just providing some oversight to make sure that we land in um, the place we're expecting to in terms of spending. And indeed, if we've had any change to plan through things like um, construction cost inflation or general slippage because of the <laughs> supply of raw materials, we're able to reallocate those resources in a relatively agile fashion so we don't um, waste your opportunity to spend that capital. But again, capital spending headroom is another key constraint for us. Um, I'll pause there because they're the main highlights and just take any questions. Thank you very much, Ted. Any questions at all? Thank you. I think it was uh, very clear. And again, the little boxes of, of key messages are extremely useful. So thank you very much for those, Ted. Everybody happy with that? We'll make that position. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Going on then to the workforce report. Um, so take the report as a breath and just pull out a few key highlights. Um, so the vacancy rate has um, has, has now um, has fallen for the first time this year, which is great. We're back in the 10 percent for vacancies. Um, we now actually as well have hit a milestone of over 4000 substantive staff now. Um, so we've seen we've got um, about 175 more staff compared to the year before. Which is good news. Um, again, sickness absence, um, it was coming down. Um, we expect that might increase slightly as we go into the winter. Don't, don't forget this report is from month eight, so from the end of November. So we, we know we've seen um, a spike of sickness over the, the winter period. Um, turnover, however, has not turned yet, and we were hoping it would have done. Um, I, I reported to board last time, I think, um, that we've reformed the retention group to look at the reasons why people are leaving. Um, we also relaunched our exit interview process and added in an extra stage, if you recall, for um, the manager's manager to also offer an exit interview. Um, we're just starting to get through the data from that now. Um, but some people are using it, some people aren't. It is optional. Um, and we had a long conversation yesterday at Trust Executive Committee about whether we would want to um, make that mandatory or not. But obviously that will increase the number of um, interviews required at this time and some people just genuinely don't want to do a, an exit interview. We do also have um, an exit questionnaire which goes out and we collect the data from that. So the retention group which Thomas is going to talk to us a little bit in, in the <laughs> uh, 
Thomas actually is leading that for us. Um, and that group of data, we know there's um, some good work going on in maternity as well, so we'll take the learning from that. So potentially we need to focus for us uh, at the moment. Um, time to hire is reducing as well, which is great. I mean, when we are recruiting people, we're getting them in post more quickly, um, and, and that's really good news. Statutory and mandatory training and appraisals remain um, remain compliant, which also is, is good news because that's a lot of hard work across the organisation to get all those appraisals in. But I mean, that's really important that people still have an appraisal um, every year, so we're doing that. Um, a really good news story for us at the moment is we've introduced um, for more food provision for staff during the winter. So we're now providing breakfast um, for staff, so the cereals and toast and bread and, and what have you available um, in the staff club here and at Witten Gate. Um, and we've agreed live cooking demonstrations and recipe posting for low cost, low cost food for staff as well. Um, and the catering team led by Frank um, are doing an absolutely fantastic job with that. And they've worked really hard on that. So I think staff will really appreciate that. We are, um, as you remember, we over the summer, we relaunched the MK Way and we've now got the MK Way for leaders, um, which will be added on to induction. And that's the launching. That's to make sure that all the managers who join the trust um, understand how our processes and procedures work and, and really understand how the trust works. Um, final couple of things from me. We took on board our new payroll provider on the 1st of January and that went well. Um, they're just going through all our data at the moment to make sure they understand it. But um, so far, touch wood, that's been going very well. Um, what lent a little less well over the Christmas period was, you'll recall, we had a bank loyalty scheme. If people did so many shifts of a certain type um, each month between um, July and December, then they got a, a payment in their Christmas pay. Um, for a small number of staff, um, they didn't get the payment or got the payment but weren't entitled to it. So um, thank you to Joan and Kate for for helping with that over the Christmas period. Um, but we've, we've, we've spoken with all the staff involved. Over a thousand staff benefited from the payments. It was a really successful scheme. It was unfortunate that a small number um, didn't go as well as we'd have hoped, um, but those staff have been contacted. And, um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Um, it's very recruitment focused, but you know that that's my background. So um, this is more about extrapolation of a bit more data for, for me just some things that i don't see it may be that thomas is going to mop some of that up anyway in a bit but um i'd be quite interested to know a little bit more about our cost for hire you know, how much is it costing us per, you know, per hire obviously it's great that the the time to hire is dropping but you know it'd be great if the cost is also dropping um uh, with the attrition how how much of that is it's first year attrition. I think that's quite a good indicator in terms of whether people come in into the organisation. There's, there's maybe some gaps or something that's causing them to leave quicker than we would like. But I know that would be interesting if we've got any yeah. updates on that. Um, I can provide that in future reports. Um, that hasn't traditionally been a problem for us. I think what we've seen, what we expected to see following COVID, was because during COVID, everyone stayed where they were. We expected people to be looking for their next steps, and that is that is what we've seen um, playing through. Is that the pe people have been looking for promotion either here or elsewhere, coupled with people choosing to make life choices. So a lot of people um, either retiring and they stayed. They probably wouldn't have re would have naturally retired during COVID, but they stayed with their teams until until um, they've seen the end of COVID effectively and back to business as usual, um, and have chosen to retire now or. Um, moved on to other other roles whether in the community um, or in hospital so we haven't traditionally seen that um, but we'll get we'll provide that data for the next month um and I, I suppose i had a bit around candidate job satisfaction but obviously you talked a bit about the exit interviews I, i'd definitely be in favor of mandatory um personally um we i, I think we recruit in loads of different ways so obviously internally um, we've got a, a recruitment team. We also use agency clearly. Um, what are, are we measuring sort of the sourcing channel effectiveness as well for the different ways you can sort of? Um, so we don't recruit through agency. Uh, we, we only recruit through our recruitment team. Okay. Um, and we use um, NHS jobs. Um, we have our own system called Track. Um, the team makes sure the best use of social media in conjunction with Kate's, Kate's communications team. Um, but everything is driven through our uh, the national NHS recruitment system effectively. Uh, we don't use headhunters for agency. Um, 
other than very, very rare occurrences where it's very, very specific roles, but we've, we've we never needed to do that here. It's all through recruitment. Cool. Um, and the last thing that I was looking at, I'm, I'm pretty sure Thomas would probably be talking about this perhaps. Um, so with my clients, normally we have what's called an adverse in, impact report, which is related to recruitment, where we're looking at measuring the disparity across protected characteristics in certain areas and certain roles, <clears throat> just to make sure that we can be more focused with the, the recruitment and it's certainly from an inclusivity point of view. Um, and I wondered whether that was something we were looking at as well in terms of the reporting line. Um, so what we do is we have the um, the Red and the Des reports, which go into detail um, for the statistics around um, protection characteristics through recruitment. We have also recently got the recruitment team to meet with all the staff networks to look at how our recruitment process is perceived by each of the networks uh, and things we can do differently with a view to if we need to, to overhaul the process. Um, so that works playing through. We don't particularly, I don't specifically include the, that data in this report, but we are doing that. Thank you. Just to say as well, so normally second associate um, colleagues that um, we're looking at, the, um, I'm going through the membership as well for subcommittees and things and some of the areas of speciality will be able to plug you in particularly with those subcommittees to, to really get a, a good feel for what's going on and ask some really good questions as well. Um, Ganesh and then David. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I suppose to, to a question to Yvonne as well, um, with the preceptorship accreditation that's available for nurses and I think later on in the year they're looking at AHPs as well. Is that something that the trust is sort of engaged with? I was thinking about uh, Jacob's question around the recruitment of newly qualified staff as well. Um, I a comment and a question, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, Daniel, massive kudos to you and your team for maintaining um, the vacancy rate. Uh, just just under a 10 percent, I think, um, given that lever rate has been going up for the last one, eight months. Uh, so huge, uh, huge congrats on that. Um, what, uh, the question was the rise in disciplinary cases and whether you had a, any indication of what, what that was um, kind of underlying factors. Um, I don't at the moment. Um, we're just watching it, if I'm honest. And um, we didn't see, we saw Next to no disciplinary cases, what we compared to what we'd usually see during COVID, and now we've had a spike. I do wonder whether it's people waiting, <laughs> um, but we are on top of that. We are looking at that, and um, Thomas will continue to monitor for the trend. Uh, but we have, we work really hard on our disciplinary processes to make sure that we've introduced um, what we call fair and just culture and lots of informal resolution so that things don't end up at dis formal disciplinary. So we make sure we've given staff the opportunity to discuss because usually it's communicate in most cases can be resolved with increased communication and uh, last question Gary Daniel I know you said this but I just want to emphasize that I think it's really important we understand um in it's understood in detail the characteristics of the the 17 percent lever rate because that's an unsustainable number and uh, I think we need to uh, get clarity about what's within it, you know, whether it is people coming up to retirement. Clearly, there's a particular environment that sits behind this at the moment. And therefore, where you would expect the, the bow wave of this to stop and where we will expect it to return back to. And I think it'd be useful if that's data driven, because clearly, it's difficult to recruit. We've had those conversations and we need to look and understand what those challenges might be going forward. And this is going to be key if people are leaving at sort of just under just under 17 percent. Yeah, so um, completely agree. Um, the retention group will be looking at that. That's that's one of their primary roles is to review that data and to identify what we can do differently in each case. It would, it I think be, again, through, through the workforce committee, we yeah, don't get the, the different the different pieces that are given and see the sort of percentages. Yeah, absolutely. No, good point, Gary. But it, yeah, we will monitor do, that. Do we? Do we actually? I, I understand the exit interviews, but do but they won't occur with everybody. Do we actually have data on that 17 percent? You know, going back to a point that was made earlier, how long they you know, are they predominantly people who are coming up to retirement age and, and factual data? Because I can't quite remember seeing that because I attended the workforce committee. I can't quite remember seeing that data. I'm sure it exists somewhere. 
That's yeah, really no, my it, question. It does exist. No, you won't have seen it. It wasn't in the workforce committee papers. Um, it, it does exist because it, it won't, as part of our national ESR system, and someone leaves, we have to put a reason for, reason for leaving it. It is very dependent on the manager doing that. Um, and as to the accuracy of that data. So we, we do, we can produce that data, it doesn't exist. But, but, no, I understand. Not so much the reason, Daniel, but the characteristics of the people who are leaving, their age and things like that. Not the subjective bit, why they're leaving, but the empirical bit. They've been with us 20 years. They've, you know, it's this group, the 54, you know, as well as the subjective bit. That, that was my point. I think we need both data. Yeah, no, we can produce that. We've got to be very careful what we produce regarding with regards to age and re retirement, though. Um, because we used to be in years gone by, we could say that's the retirement age, but that's yeah. not the case anymore. Um, so we, we can produce that data and um, the retention the retention group can have a look at that and then we will bring it to the workforce committee. Great. Just satisfying yourself that your assumptions are validated in, in, in evidence, that's all. That was my only point. Thank you very much. OK, um, I'd like to just move everybody on because I'm, I think the, the next item in particular the people we're very interested in. Um, so we're going on to the updates on quality, diversity and inclusion. So Thomas, I know you're going to do the presentation on this. Thank you very much. OK, um, afternoon everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Thomas Dunkley. I'm Head of Employee Relations here at The Trust. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, quality, diversity and inclusion, specifically an update on uh, Black, Asian, minority and ethnic uh, uh, group uh, progress. Um, we, we are um, looking at this is just a quick summary. I'm going to pull out two things from this. The rest of this we'll talk through as we go through the presentation. So just two sort of items of note. One is around gender pay gap. Um, so our gender pay gap is consistently uh, decreasing year on year. Uh, so from 2020, it's reduced to 20% in 2020. It is now 16%. Uh, so that is uh, reducing every year. Uh, in terms of equal opportunity, uh, employees with disabilities uh, believe that the trust provides equal opportunity for career progression and promotion, which is really positive. Also, just to add to those good news stories, um, uh, we've been nominated for an award at the This Is Us Diversity and Inclusion Awards. That's for their Employee Resource Group Award, which is about recognising um, groups that have made a positive impact on their organisation and senior stakeholder engagement. And Idris, who's our EDI and I lead, who's sitting in the corner, uh, it has also been nominated for the change. So lots of really positive things happening there. OK, so I just want to give you some key metrics around um, the BME progress. So 36% uh, of the trust's employees are BME. And that's compared with the local uh, population of 26%. That's based on the um, 2011 census data. We're obviously waiting for the final published data for the 2021 census. So imagine that will change. It'll be interesting to see how much that's changed by. Um, BME candidates are more likely to be appointed from shortlisting uh, than white candidates, and they're less likely to enter formal disciplinary processes than uh, white employees. They're also more likely to access non-mandatory training and continual professional development opportunities than white employees. Um, and we are moving towards 25% of uh, full board attendance being BME. Where we have work to, to improve on is that um, BME employees are more likely to face discrimination, abuse, bullying, harassment, protections or colleagues than white employees. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in those areas as we've progressed uh, through the presentation. First of all, I just want to talk to you about representation. So looking at the trust as a whole and over the last five years, uh, we can see that we have seen a consistent uh, increase in BME representation in our workforce. Uh, so that's moved from 26% uh, in 2017 and 2018 up to 36%. Uh, in 21-22 and as I mentioned the, for context the, the latest census data says that the community is 26% BME but obviously that's not just the full picture we need to look at where we employ people um, so we've seen an increase over the last 12 months of BME employees within senior bands within the last 12 months um, so we've seen in band six a, a four percentage point increase uh, and it's also in band seven and then in bands eight and nine one percentage point increase. there's lots of work for us still to do there but we are seeing that it's moving in in the right direction Breaking that down a little bit more, if we look at um, not just people in, in, in employees in post, but in terms of people that we've hired over the last 12 months, we can see that in most bands, we have hired uh, a, a, a higher percentage of BME uh, employees within the last 12 months. So that has increased. Uh, and in lots of bands, you can see that's in, 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 increased quite significantly. So internal statistics show that compared to last year, uh, more BME employees believe 
Trust provides equal opportunity to the career progression and promotion, and less of based bullying, harassment, or abuse from patients and colleagues, and less of based discrimination from their line manager. Uh, we've undertaken undertake a lot of work around these areas trust wide, looking at our violence and aggression and unacceptable behaviours group, uh, but also through cultural awareness training that we've been rolling out in, in certain areas of the business. So, how have we achieved all of that? So, I think the, the first thing is we have a strong and embedded BME network uh, that was has been in place since May 2020 and has about 20, 220 members across the trust. Uh, they undertake regular events, including engagement and education activities, and work closely with the EDI team on all aspects of our agenda. Uh, they've also created really strong links with um, local um, groups, such as the uh, MK Intercultural Forum and local debate networks, and are all working with them to share knowledge and, and good practice. And as Joe mentioned earlier, he's taking over as uh, uh, executive sponsor of the of the group, and we've also uh, uh, awarded all of the networks uh, a small budget of a thousand pounds so that they can. Um, utilize that to uh, promote their, their, their activities. We have uh, created associate NED roles uh, to uh, um, provide opportunities for those who may not experience a uh, non accepted director level. Uh, we've created three of those positions to provide an experience and access to underserved communities and with the potential for more of those positions in the future. Um, the addition of these positions has led uh, to uh, representation on the board increasing to 25%, uh, with us moving towards. 30% uh, with the latest round of recruitment that we've done, so moving in a really positive direction. And now recent board recruitment, four out of seven, seven successful candidates have been from a BME background. Uh, next point is something that Alison um, referred to earlier, which is the Inclusion and Leadership Council. Uh, that, that's been in place since November 2021, uh, and that's, trust, uh, that's chaired by uh, the Trust Chair, and it's the formal mechanism for the staff networks uh, to engage with the trust board and acts as a network of networks so the networks can also get together to discuss issues that may be uh, mutually relevant. Uh, they meet regularly to discuss on topics, um, papers of interest from the board and also uh, meeting papers and advise the trust chair of areas for improvement that the board should focus on. Uh, the cultural intelligence programme is something that we've been working really hard on over the last 12 months and that's in conjunction with a training provider called Above Difference. Um, and that has been rolled out uh, with senior leadership. So in May of last year, uh, the board attended a training day, uh, which involved uh, as well pre-assessments and uh, follow-up sessions uh, to talk through cultural intelligence at a senior level. Uh, and members of our team, so our employee relations team and also our quality and diversity and inclusion team are on their facilitations program so that we can have uh, in-house trainers who are ready to continue that work um, in the future. With, and we've also got further board training days uh, planned and uh, a rollout to uh, the next sort of level of senior leadership on the track. Uh, cultural awareness training. This is something that we have uh, been rolling out sort of in support of our intelligence. This is um, to educate employees on subjects of microaggressions, unconscious bias, bullying, discrimination and harassment, including racism and sexual harassment. Um, and we're delivering that in target areas. So we're using the data we have from our employee relations cases to see where we have areas where we feel that that, that work is needed uh, and have been targeting those areas specifically. Uh, and this embeds also the idea of, of belonging, which is a, a key feature of the NHS People Plan. Chief Nurse Fellowships, this is something we implemented in January of uh, last year uh, to support the progression of BME uh, colleagues within the nursing profession. We had uh, three roles at Band 6 for BME nurses. Uh, with each given the opportunity to work closely with the chief nurse and senior nursing leadership to develop essential leadership skills for the future. And I believe two of those, uh, now that the, that program has finished its first cohort, two of those employees have moved on to senior roles. Uh, and we're reviewing that scheme for how we work that in the future and how we can uh, continue to deliver it. Just a, a last few points on, on, on this then. So anti-racism pledge, this is something that we signed up to last year in September. Uh, this is run by the East of England as part of the anti-racism strategy and it's to create it's been created to improve the experience of BME people uh, both employees and patients uh, service users across the system and our next steps are to embed this across the trust by promoting uh, the pledge internally. We've undertaken a number of allyship events this has been led by our main network um, normally during Black History Month this year, we, we held uh, a number of uh, allyship events um, and uh, these were uh, attended by Joe, who did the talk, and also Nikki, Nikki Bensmere, who uh, also delivered a talk uh, on, on allyship. And finally, the RES engagement. So RES is our Workforce Race Equality Standard. That's a key report that's published as part of our public sector equality duty. 
Um, I and mean, every year we, 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 we undertake that exercise. And what we've started to do year on year now is publish infographics for trust staff because we realize that the metrics are uh, perhaps not the most friendly, uh, they're not worded in the most friendly of way. So we're trying to make them make sense to people. So we've started to create infographics that we've uh, built with the networks. And we're going to be uh, publishing those as posters uh, across the trust so that they can have some meaning to everybody um, and we can share the good news as well. So that's um, how we've achieved it. So the next stage is to talk about areas for improvement. So we know one of our areas for improvement is representation. And what we aim to do is improve representation of BME employees in senior management roles and also across all areas and job groups in the trust. Uh, bullying, harassment and discrimination. We want to eradicate bullying and harassment in the trust, uh, including uh, racism and uh, har um, uh, sorry, racism and racial related bullying harassment. Closing the gap also between lived experience and what's race, you know, what's the difference between what people are experiencing and what they're telling us they're experiencing. Career opportunities, we want to create increased access to career development opportunities, uh, including formal opportunities and also informal coaching, mentoring, etc. Uh, and the last one is what we've touched on already, which is around recruitment practices, fair and equitable recruitment practices with the removal of bias. So, summary of our future actions. Uh, a talent management program is in development that is to provide talent management opportunities uh, for all employees of the trust, but ensuring engagement with the staff network so there is a, a route in for employees from a BME background, but also disability and other protected characteristics. We will continue to roll out the cultural awareness and intelligence program. We know what our statistics are showing us in terms of the discrepancy about discrimination and abuse. So we're trying to look at changing the culture of the trust and working with employees um, to support that change. Um, inclusive recruitment practices are underway. We've met the network and we're looking at how each stage of that process can be improved, uh, taking their feedback, how we can make sure that um, managers are able to shortlist a uh, point uh, a more diverse group of people and how we can make those uh, processes more friendly and supportive to those applying. Um, the Fair and Trust Culture Review, which Danielle alluded to, is something we're undertaking as part of our disciplinary process to look at how um, our fair and kind our processes are making sure that we're not only looking to conclude matters quickly but also fairly and ensuring that we don't enter into any process um, that we don't need to because we have to acknowledge that when we enter into any form of disability process it causes harm to that individual and that's the kind of guiding principle of that so looking at how we can make those processes better. Uh, Idris is undertaking the Red uh, Res Experts program so he's looking at um, working with a cohort of other um, EDI leads from other trusts to uh, gain a national certificate on the, the REST program to help us embed that further and work with our colleagues across the CNHS on that. We're also leading on system wide leadership. So we know there's lots of good work um, happening across the system in terms of the EDI. So we are setting up a group uh, with uh, the ICB um, so that we can lead on sharing good practice and on work that may be beneficial across, across the patch. Um, we're looking at overseas recruitment groups, so our networks are developing, we are working to identify new networks and one of the ones that we feel might be supportive of uh, staff is an overseas uh, recruits group which will be there to support those who have been uh, recruited overseas um, and as they have quite unique experiences that uh, we can provide support for. And then the last thing is uh, each of our networks will be having a freedom to speak up champion. So uh, the deputy chair of each network will become a freedom to speak up champion as well which will support on that piece of work. And that's just, uh, again, a summary. Thank you very much. Thanks. Like a rush there. Huge, yeah. huge amount of stuff going on. Um, right. <laughs> uh, questions to start with you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Brilliant presentation. Thank you. It gives a, a great sense of where you, where you start and where you're, where you're looking to go. My question is really around probably the overseas recruitment because I think there's a, there's a drive nationally to, to recruit from abroad and there's cultural barriers that come with that. And just, you know, you've got the overseas recruitment group. There's a consciousness that needs to be, I'm sure you've probably thought of it, a consciousness that needs to be thought about in terms of breaking those cultural barriers because people are coming into a new country, a new working environment and obviously different structures and ways of working that they may not be used to. So my, my, my question really is, how are we approaching that? And how and how will that overseas recruitment group take that into consideration? Um, that's my that's my only concern. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's a it's a, it's a it's a legitimate concern. I think we've done a lot of work um, from a pastoral perspective for those uh, nurses, because it's mainly nurses and surgeons mm -hmm. coming across. 
Um, I think what we want to do is provide the opportunity for them to lead, lead or inform us on that work through that group uh, so that they can, you know, we can identify what those barriers might be. I think we have an idea of what the board ones are, but in terms of that sort of granular detail, that group will help us working with the EDI team push forward to that agenda. Would it be almost like so, a first? So just <laughs> coming on the back of that, you know, we did have that conversation when, when we met as well, uh, to the extent of whether we even want to keep calling it the OTs. Yeah. Yeah, group and and so <laughs> part of that is well let's not us decide this yeah. let's have the conversations with the individuals and the team as they come in and it's a bit like the fame network you know we we asked what that network wanted to call themselves and they wanted to call themselves the main network so so we're going to do the same with and then get from them a list of issues directly so that we can make sure that we are doing the right thing with them. I'll find that something to be conscious of is people might not be willing to give that information from the get-go. So it's probably people that have already come through the process, have been embedded, or the voice initially to allow them then to yeah. speak. So it's... Thanks, Jim, for coming on this point. Thanks, Thomas. Great presentation. Um, just a minor point. Could we be consistent with BAME or BME? Um, let's choose one of them and just stick with it because I don't, yeah. I don't want to keep dropping the A. I don't know if there's a reason for that. Or just... uh, I think the difference that we have is I think we typically use BME, but the Bay Network prefers to be called the Bay Network. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It would just be great if we could choose one. And again, so great, some great stats on there. Thank, thank you for that. Um, the one you didn't mention was the one I sent you around recruitment. Um, so if you're white, you have a 41% chance of being shortlisted, whereas if you're BME, you have a 20% chance of being shortlisted. I appreciate it, but your stat was once you're shortlisted. You yes, might have yeah, that's the risk. That's right. right? Um, but then the overall stat for recruitment is if you're BME, you have a 3% uh, probability of being hired, whereas if you're white, you have eight percent probability of hiring. Right? This was the data you yeah, said. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. so I, I just thought that was worth sharing because yeah. it gives a balanced view. Of, you know, there's some great work being done in this area, but I think it's it's good that we recognise that there's still yeah, um, a way to go. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just just on that shortlisting piece, if I can mm -hmm. come in, I I thought, and correct me if I get this wrong, I thought shortlisting was done completely anonymously. It is, yeah, sure. It is, yeah. It is yeah. like, yes, yeah. so um, it's, not, it's not any names, it's, it's, it's yeah. numbers. Numbers. obligation numbers. Okay, so that, that, so that, that may or may not, it's one of those, if it's done anonymously, how are we, how are we able to influence that? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I'm getting lost, the short list of that. Yeah. It's in my study that, a medical school in Chennai that's yes. still on my yes, CV in, in the UK. So there are still elements, even though my details are redacted in that school. Yeah. 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 And we have we have been asked we have asked NHS jobs if they can look into that because that is something that yeah. we've asked them to look at because we know the statistic we know that this shortlisting is it has all the names taken off of it, it has addresses taken off etc. We have asked NHS jobs to look if there's anything else that they can do to make it more, more anonymous. Yeah. Um, and I think the one last thing I, I, I just ask really is, and I think we talked about this at Workforce, but do forgive me if we didn't, it's just in my head, but we talked about night shifts and we've heard anecdotally that there are a higher percentage of a staff on night shifts and it would be good to dig into the reasons why, because again, anecdotally, we've heard that they receive less abuse at night, et cetera, et cetera. But these are the things that have been told by staff. And it'd be good to dig into that data. And I thought we talked about digging into that data. Yeah. Maybe so, so, back yeah, so if you recall, we did um, a survey of the night staff probably about four months ago, five months ago now, um, and to find out why they work nights, was it through choice, was it because they were rostered on tonight, what, what was that, any, any other issues around working nights. Um, and we didn't have an enormous response, to be honest. Um, but the, of the responses we did get, people were choosing to work nights because um, of the pay rates at nights and the environment at night is they just prefer to work nights or because they've got carers or childcare commitments and it lets them balance 
uh, balance that at home. Um, it, the survey around the night workers fed back things like it depends on the manager they have as to whether how often they see their manager. Um, so Yvonne is doing some work on making sure that they that's more structured. Um, and Yvonne and I have got an action to bring back to um, to the exec team in a couple of months to redo the survey um, and to see what 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 movement we've had and hopefully to get a better response rate this time. Um, but from the survey that we looked at, from the responses we did get, I was assured that the people who were working nights were working nights because that was their choice to work nights. Which was, which was good news, uh, but we will do a second survey and hopefully get a better response rate. I think the other thing is about uh, the Inclusion Leadership Council. One of the things we talk about, in particular, with the, with the networks, looking at almost having some programmes of pieces of work. I think something like this might be a very good thing to ask the networks for their for their route of um, feedback as well. And if, if the responses are low, it would be helpful to see if we can get more response out of them. Um, and I think the other the other interesting conversation we had as part of this was as a as a good employer, we know that working nights consistently shortens your lifespan. And so at what point do we intervene as a good employer and say, actually, no, we don't want you to be working nights and then potentially the consequent impact on the workforce who have chosen to work by it. So I think there's some really, really interesting issues that we're getting into. Mm -hmm. and the reason I raise it is because I think we are, as a team now, having those conversations that we absolutely weren't having even 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. And you know, how, how, do we, how do we influence some of these really important things? Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay. I, I guess just that I would be really keen to bring to board with when we look at things like the res data or any other um, data, the lived experience of our staff, because sometimes the you know the res the looking at data tells you, you know, something that can tell you progress and lack of progress, but it can't also tell you can't always tell you the lived experience of staff. And actually, often the lived experience of staff doesn't reflect that data. Um, and I think it's really powerful to hear from people um, with lived experience of um, racism who want to be anti-racist and who want to take a really strong leadership position on this at the board and I think that's really important that those experiences have a place here that staff have a voice here and so that we're able to yeah. to do that. Absolutely yeah no I think that'd be great actually we can yeah let's look at the agenda and see how we can we can bring it in. Mm -hmm. so, just, just bring that so we did ask um, well, when we knew we were doing this presentation we did ask the network yeah. if they wanted to, to attend if we wanted to um, uh, the network board chair, fortunately, because I think because it was short notice, um, they haven't been able to because of rosters and things. Um, but what we're going to do going forward is because we've got um, we've got three key areas. We've got um, and then we've got uh, disability and gender pay gap. Um, I've asked Thomas if he'll come to the public board on a sort of six monthly rolling basis for each of those. And if we can get that scheduled in, we can get members of the network to come as well and to bring a bit like a patient story, but uh, mm -hmm. getting Kate to play a point on board, a bit like a lot of experience as well. Two members board are happy on that. Yeah, so I think the comments will be happy. Absolutely, Jason. Thank you very much again, Thomas. Really good. Okay. One of the things I wanted to know is if, what what do we do in terms of the aftermath? So when we've had occurrences where somebody's faced racism, what have you, in the life of duty, what do we do with them afterwards? So how how do we not think of the, the aftermath of the experience and what kind of conversations are we have with them to support them? It's a horrible feeling. I've been through myself working. I didn't really want to go back into the environment again because something really bad happened. What what are we doing to help to protect that? Yes, I think it depends on what, how that occurs. I think we have um, sort of structures around debriefs and, and further situations where it's, uh, members of the public um, who did have a mindset for the HR employment perspective, it would be support through the, through the HR team to the occupational health. Through the yeah, I think that's probably the best way to Thank you again, Tom. Have we I can't remember, have we, we haven't circulated this yet. I mean, I know I've seen it at the <coughs> Leadership Council, but we can circulate this good board. I think it'd be useful because that'd be great. Yeah. And thank you very much, um, both you and you know, all the hard work. And um, some great, we're moving in the right direction, but there's lots to do. And um, you know, it's a really dynamic agenda. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure I got the right, yes, 22.
Um, uh, it's just a quick one from me. It was something we felt we ought to um, just acknowledge and then have a go to the board that um, with the appointments of Deb, Precious and Jason, they're, they're all involved in the community foundation as well. So um, <laughs> it's just to sort of bring that uh, into the open to say, obviously, as with all of us, you know, we manage our conflicts of interest if there might be some, um, but we thought it was probably just a good idea to note it because um, we know it's a, it's a very dynamic organisation with all the kids, but, um, but uh, we're great, it was great to have you all on board. So, but that's just to note. Uh, corporate risk report. Thank you. Um, it's a slightly different risk report because it doesn't include, um, <laughs> it, it's focusing on, it's trying to give a, a summary with some trend analysis rather than just a great big spreadsheet with lots of um, risks listed. Um, so we can see um, the sort of risk profile of the organisation. Uh, there is some um, around, you know, overdue review of risk, actually that numbers compared to the overall number of risks on the register is really low. Um, there is um, an interesting um, bit on the, the report um, towards the end of the report where there is an incident um, sort of reporting data and we're putting that on there so that we can correlate that with risk and how we profile risk in the organisation so you can see this bit up which trend for example in violence and abuse against um, the staff we talked about it before to be here um, before one that work, work around that is ongoing um, but it's a slightly different report, slightly, slightly sort of, slightly sort of high level really, um, around with a couple of key risks of uh, movements on and off the corporate risk register um, noted in the report. So, have any questions? The big, the full reports will still go in detail to people to. Very much. Okay. Any questions on this report? No. I'm pretty happy. Thank you very much, Kate. Yeah, I think it's it's very clear. So, thank you. Thank you for that. Um. Declarations of interest. Yes. Okay, um, again. <laughs> so, I, uh, almost this uh, declaration of interest. Obviously, there are new board members uh, who aren't reflected on here and uh, we need to be. Um, it, it's published on our website. It's updated regularly. Obviously, we we bring it to board um, on a regular basis. Um, but any changes to people's interests need to be declared in the year, not waiting for comment to ask for them. Um, and we reflect, we reflect and update them live on the website. Um, it goes beyond members, board members. That's the um, that's the next paper brief in the outlines. Uh, obviously, if you're if you're looking at your um, interests here and your conflicts particularly, um, please and that you're thinking that they're wrong and missing something, please do update them. Great. Yeah. No, then, yes, as soon as possible. For this anything. Obviously, our new colleagues will be on here very soon. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Okay, those are noted. And use of trusting. Uh, yes, just for, just for, for noting, please. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, that's noted. Thank you very much. Um, now we've got the summary reports from our subcommittees. Obviously, I'm not going to go through those individually, but just to ask colleagues if they would be noted anything that they've committed they've been on and it hasn't been um, recognised on, it's not been recognised on them. Or if everybody's happy, we will note these summaries. Great, thank you very much. And we've got two terms of reference, Charitable Funds Committee and the Trust Executive Committee. Yes, yeah, so they've both been reviewed in committee um, and have come then here for approval. The tech um, one just had a very tiny typo where it still says tech in one of the big headings and it should say tech. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but otherwise they're here for approval, please. Great, okay. Any questions or comments on them? Everybody's happy? Great. Those are accepted. Thank you and approved. Um, the forward agenda planner. <coughs> My colleagues put anything on that was missing on there. It's pretty comprehensive. Yeah. And obviously, the, um, I think the couple of things that we mentioned today, which will be sorted in um, as we go forward. Everybody happy with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you very much. Um, now we just get to item 29 questions from members of the public. Um, we had a couple. Um, the first one is from our previous um, lead governor, actually, Alan Hastings. Um, he says, with delays in elective treatment, what is the process for moving patients forward in the queue if their condition has worsened and for ensuring the patients are not inadvertently dropped off the queue? Everyone think that's you? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the question, Alan. I, I think to provide some reassurance, we do have an internal harm review process which our clinical teams undertake on those long waits in patients. 
and, and that's a, a nationally advised process to be undertaking there. There are other elements and ways of accessing, and certainly a GP is still very eligible to contact um, the consultant and escalate any need for any urgent treatment. Um, similarly, a patient seen in clinic presenting in a different way can also be escalated and brought forward in doing so. In order to address the point about dropping off the queue, we, we have some administration validation processes and checks and audit cycles that we undertake in order to keep sure that that is not any person we have. So happy to take any different answer to take any further questions. Um, no, absolutely. I think if there's anything specific, Alan, feel free to email me or, or Emma directly for further detail. Great. OK, thank you very much. And then the second question is from Virginia Bell, and it says, will the chair or CEO or other person of the hospital trust board meet with me, a concerned member of the public, to discuss how to further the offering of healthy and plant based foods in the hospital shop, automatic machines, cafe, restaurant and patients meals? The aim would be to reduce the offering of unhealthy and unsustainable foods and to increase the offering of healthy, sustainable foods within hospital premises. The results of such a policy would be a reduction of greenhouse gases, pollution and pesticides and a reduction in ill health in the community. The planet, people and animals would benefit and the NHS would save countless pounds due to the improvement in people's health. Um, and I, I've got a response here. Um, first thing to note is that um, Virginia raised this last year um, and actually the issue went up to the Ombudsman, Parliamentary Ombudsman, um, but the matter wasn't taken any further there. Um, and it's fine that um, you raised it again, Virginia, but um, just to say that our meals are developed with our dietitians and include vegan options. And actually this month in Veganuary, and it's a national thing, there is a more extensive range as well. Um, really, we have to know we can't take a unilateral decision to enforce one type of diet for our patients or staff, as I'm sure you would appreciate. But um, perhaps it might be helpful if you contact your MP, um, because we feel that you could perhaps encourage a rational debate, because certainly um, a major change like this to uh, a statutory service would certainly need a uh, national debate. So I would strongly uh, recommend that you contact your MP. But as I say, we do um, develop all our meals with with our dietitians and and we do include vegan options so um, as you're probably aware that we do have a sustainability agenda as well in this organization and and what we eat is is part of that so thank you for your question okay um, so now just come to the motion to close this um, meeting is in, that's in the public section and um, I've Colleagues, we, we have half an hour for lunch, and then those of us that are staying on for the part two, and we'll reconvene in half an hour. Excuse me. Can I not respond to that answer? Um, is that you, Virginia? Yes. No, I'm sorry. This is it's a meeting held in public. It's not a public meeting, so it's not like the council, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. I'll see you in half an hour. Cheers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's all I'm going to say.